Yesterday, the House Government Reform Committee held a hearing on dietary supplements. FDA officials and nutrition experts testified about advances in research as well as regulation. Indiana Representative Dan Burton chaired the hearing. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. Good afternoon. A quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and, op written and opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. Seven years ago, the people of the United States raised their voices in unison and told Congress that we needed to give clear direction to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, in regard to dietary supplement regulations. That cry from every state in the Union, every congressional district across the country, was heard in Washington and resulted in a unanimous vote to pass the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, commonly known as DSHEA. Americans are passionate about their freedoms. We cherish our rights to free speech, religion, a free press, our right to bear arms, and our right to make our own nutritional choices. Time and again, Americans have joined together across philosophical and political divides and demanded that the federal government not impede our access to dietary supplements. The FDA over time has represented itself as having a clear bias against the marketing of dietary supplements under anything except the drug framework. Prior to DSHEA, they tried various ploys to restrict the market. In the 1970s, the FDA issued a proposed rulemaking that would have allowed the agency to classify vitamins and minerals as drugs if they exceeded levels of, of potency that the agency considered rational or useful. The American public was outraged, and rightfully so. Congress responded to this by enacting the Proxmire Admin Amendment, thus stopping FDA dead in its tracks in its posturing to classify dietary supplements as drugs. Our victories with the Proxmire Amendment and the passage of DSHEA were but individual battles won along the way. We have to remain ever vigilant in our oversight to ensure that the FDA properly implements the law. That's the role of the Congressional Oversight and the Cov Committee on Government Reform. During the 106th Congress, this committee conducted two hearings. The first looked at the FDA's proposed structure function regulation in which they sought to use a definition of disease that had been considered and rejected by the Congress. The FDA's maneuvering would have created a climate where almost any structure function claim could have been considered an illegal disease claim. The public once again came together as one voice and more than 170,000 individuals submitted statements to the FDA regarding the proposed structure function rule. As a result of the public outcry and strong congressional oversight, the FDA made changes to the proposed rule so that it was in line with the DSHEA law. The second hearing we conducted looked at the FDA's adverse events reporting system for special nutritionals using the dietary supplement ephedra as an example. The FDA admitted during the hearing that the system was problematic. That was almost two years ago, and Mr. Levitt is back today and will update us on whether or not the FDA has improved the system. Additionally, the dietary supplement ephedra continues to be in the news, used in traditional Chinese medicine for asthma, ephedra, or ma wang, as they call it, has been safely used for thousands of years. In the United States, it has been safely and effectively used for weight loss as well. With the health effects associated with obesity plaguing the nation, there is a growing body of research evidence that verifies the effectiveness of this product to maintain a healthy weight. Ephedra earned notoriety after reports of adverse events in Texas from a product called Nature's Formula One. It was a product represented as a dietary supplement containing ephedra. The product turned out to be illegally spiked with a synthetic ephedrine and thus not a dietary supplement at all. 
Additionally, several fringe companies began illegally marketing high doses of, of ephedra or ma wong as natural alternatives to illicit street drugs. These two illegal actions have caused the FDA to spiral into a massive four-year rulemaking process seeking to regulate an entire product category. There have been legitimate adverse event reports about ephedra, and some of them have been serious. I think the industry has been very responsive to FDA's concerns, putting warning labels, warnings on labels and working to get the bad apples out of the supplement industry. Because ephedra is known to be a mild stimulant, consumers need to pay attention to product labels and not take the product if they have a medical condition listed in the warning. They also need to pay attention to dosing and not think that if two is good for them, then four or six would be great. It should also be noted that the FDA has not shown evidence of how often these events have occurred that have occurred are natural occurrences or product-related events. There are some that complain to us that the FDA was going to use the ephedra issue as a means of asking that Deshaies be overturned. I hope that's not the case. As a part of the executive branch, FDA employees, the same as those of us in the legislative branch, are public servants. That is, we serve the people of the United States. The people have spoken about how dietary supplements should be regulated. We in Washington heard their voices, and I hope the FDA is listening as well. I hope the FDA staff will accept that Deshaies is the law and work earnestly to implement this six-year-old law appropriately. One of the issues that arises time and again with regard to the FDA's management of supplement regulation is that in six years they failed to establish good manufacturing practices for dietary supplements. They waited until the very end of the last administration to move their proposal forward, even though they had strong support from the industry to establish these guidelines. It is our understanding that the new administration is currently reviewing the FDA pr a proposal. We hope that it will be expedited very quickly. Today we will hear from the Natural Nutritional Foods Association. They'll explain their Good Manufacturing Practices Certification Program. We repeatedly hear in the media that, Deshay, that with Deshaies, the FDA lost its power to regulate dietary supplements. This is absolutely false. As we have discussed in previous hearings, the FDA has seven points of authority to regulate dietary supplements, and they use them. A list of those points of authority is appended to this statement. The hearing is about two topics today, the national and the international regulation of dietary supplements. I said earlier that the American public is passionate about their rights to make nutritional choices and that they have become one voice regarding the FDA's handling of dietary supplement regulation. Americans are also very passionate about our rights to retain American sovereignty. In 1961, in a desire to establish food safety standards, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Health Organization established a joint program, the Codex Alimentarius. There are numerous commissions within the Codex, including the Commission on Nutrition and Foods of Special Dietary Uses, through which 165 countries are discussing topics including dietary supplement regulation and the establishment of standards. We have received a lot of complaints from citizens in, in this country. They're concerned that if countries who regulate dietary supplements more restrictively than the U.S. decide to vote en bloc at Codex meetings, that our views will be overridden. Many Americans are afraid that eventually there will be restrictions placed on dietary, dietary supplement access. The FDA has stated previously that we are under no obligation to accept Codex. But I have asked Congressional Research Services to review the Codex agreements and to clarify our obligations. Many of the 165 countries that participate in the Codex look to the United States to take the lead in regulatory no negotiations. We fail our citizens and the citizens of the world if we do not take a strong stand in supporting Deshaies internationally. In addition to scientists, I suggest that the U.S. delegation to Codex include representatives from the U.S. government who are experts in international trade negotiations and that FDA staff and all individuals representing the United States government in negotiations regarding dietary supplements negotiate from the Deshaies perspective. 
It is important that we protect Americans' access to supplements as well as ensure that trade barriers are not erected that will reduce U.S. manufacturers' access to the international marketplace. Dietary supplements are an important factor in, in maintaining and improving health. My colleagues in Congress and I will continue to protect Americans' rights to access dietary supplements. The record will remain open until April 2nd, and I'll now recognize my colleague, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing will examine the international and national regulation of dietary supplements since the passage of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, or DSHEA, in uh, 1994. Uh, supplements are more popular than ever. According to a recent article in U.S. News & World Report, supplement sales last year in the United States reached $16 billion. An estimated 123.5 million Americans use supplements sold in drugstores, grocery stores, malls, on the Internet, and in gyms and sports, sports clubs. Dietary supplements can be very beneficial. For example, calcium can help prevent osteoporosis, and pregnant women should take folic acid in order to help prevent neural tube defects in the developing fetus. Unfortunately, safety risks. St. John's wort uh, taken uh, to treat uh, certain kinds of depression can interact negatively with a variety of drugs, including several classes of drugs taken to treat AIDS. The American Medical Association believes ephedrine supplements sold for weight loss should be removed from the market. According to a letter from the AMA to the FDA, the evidence, quote, the evidence to support the benefit of these products for use in weight loss is outright weighed by the risks, end quote. The public expects FDA to act to weed out safe from unsafe products. But in fact, dietary supplements are largely unregulated in many important respects. This is due to FDA's lack of resources and the law itself, which took away uh, much of FDA's authority uh, to regulate supplements. <laughs> Under DSHEA, FDA cannot require the supplement manufacturers substantiate the claims they make on the labels, nor require information beyond the labels about the uh, dangers of interaction with other uh, uh, other ingredients or pharmaceuticals. The burden of proof for safety uh, problems is on the FDA even when problems arise and are reported. And FDA cannot require supplement man makers to report adverse events as it does with other products such as drugs, devices, and vaccines. And I have to say even members of Congress have difficulty in getting information they need. In the summer and fall of 1999, I sent out a letter to a number of dietary supplement manufacturers and distributors, as well as to manufacturers of di dietary supplement ingredients. And I asked for basic information regarding procedures for quality control, what research the companies use to substantiate any claims they make that their products are safe and effective, and for consumer com uh, com complaint information. Out of the 49 letters we sent out, only 10 companies responded six of them by letter, three by phone, and one through a meeting. One letter was returned by the post office. In total, only two companies sent the requested information. This is a very poor record. Many experts have suggested that we need to require adverse event reporting about supplements. The uh, industry's failure to respond clearly suggests that we need to seriously consider this suggestion. There are some things that the FDA can and should do under current law to regulate the supplement industry, and these are areas where I think we all agree. The FDA has the authority to issue regulations for supplement good manufacturing practices, or GMPs. This would be an important step in protecting consumers. GMPs, in theory, could help ensure that products contain what the label says they contain and help consumers make more educated choice about their supplements. I believe that Americans need access to safe and effective supplements, but that does not mean we should permit misleading or unsupported claims to flourish or allow the public to be needlessly exposed to unsafe products. When it comes to our international uh, concerns, I share uh, the, the uh, views that are going to be expressed today by a number of witnesses that I don't want to see, because of international trade agreements, our laws being reduced are being eliminated or superseded. 
That has been one of my ongoing concerns about the international trade agreements, that uh, what we have decided in this country is best for our own people would be considered a trade barrier, and we would be forced to uh, drop those laws and adopt some international standard, which may not be what the American people uh, would like to have in its place. So I, I, I want to express that concern, and it's an ongoing one, and I look forward to hearing more about it from uh, the witnesses. I, I think this is a, uh, a hearing that uh, should bring out a lot of information that will be useful to policymakers as we review the whole issue of uh, dietary supplements and how they are handled both na in this country on a national basis and in international forums. And I thank you for holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Ms. Morello, do you have an opening statement? Mr. Chairman, I'll make it very brief. I want to thank you and uh, Ranking Member Waxman for holding this, hear this hearing today on the status of national and international dietary supplement regulation and research. Seven years ago, Congress passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. And in so doing, Congress recognized that many people believe dietary supplements offer health benefits and that consumers should have a greater opportunity in determining which supplements uh, may best help them. This law essentially gave dietary supplement manufacturers freedom to market more products as dietary supplements and provide information about their products' benefits. Consumers would have more responsibility for checking the safety of dietary supplements and determining the truthfulness of label claims. This is a unique situation for consumers, manufacturers, and the FDA because most foods and drugs are regulated more before they hit the marketplace. Consequently, Congress and this committee has a responsibility to ensure that these dietary supplements are safe and that the FDA is dispersing the information that it does receive so that consumers can be sure that dietary supplements are not doing harm to them or their families. So I look forward to the testimony, Mr. Chairman, from our expert panels and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Morella. Mr. Tierney? No opening statement. Uh, Ms. Davis? Mr. Cannon? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you uh, and the ranking member for holding uh, this hearing also. I'm pleased today that we'll be examining the progress made in the area of dietary supplement regulation and research. Dietary supplements are quickly becoming a very large part uh, of American health care. Uh, they're not just for weight loss and muscle building, but uh, many of the supplements provide nutri nutrients and minerals that human needs for a healthy life and a healthy lifestyle. I'm particularly interested in this industry because of its presence in uh, my district. In fact, uh, I like to think of uh, my district in Utah generally as being sort of the heart of the uh, dietary supplement industry. We have a very large number of folks there, many of whom are here today, and we want to welcome you all back to Washington. Uh, the Dietary Supplement uh, Health and Education Act I was a first step in facilitating growth in the dietary supplement industry. It established a set of basic guidelines for marketing uh, these products in an effort to inform consumers about the products they purchase. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration currently has in place loose guidelines for the regulation of dietary supplements. These regulations have been slow moving in comparison with the growth of the industry, which has been pretty phenomenal. And I think uh, currently we have many, many Americans who are, are, are using uh, supplements. Um, uh, in their daily diets. It's important that we work to establish guidelines and regulations that will not hamper the growth of the industry but will assure an individual the best possible information so he can thoughtfully make decisions about his or, or her health. Such guidelines help to make uh, dietary supplements a trusted part of our health care system and uh, I'm anxious to uh, gather the information we'll do here in this hearing. Mr. Chairman, I thank you and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. <clears throat> we are very fortunate today to have uh, Representative uh, Frank Pallone with us from New Jersey, Frank Pallone, Jr. And uh, although we have not always uh, agreed on everything, I think we uh, share the same views on uh, the issue today, and we're very well, very happy to welcome you to the committee, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and, and thank you for extending me the, the opportunity to speak before you today. I have to say I'm not a very good example of preventative medicine today because I have a cold, but, I, but I'm going to continue with my testimony in any case. Mr. Chairman, as you know, um, dietary supplement issues are a very important health care issue for my state and for my uh, constituents. Uh, New Jersey is one of the states with a significant number of dietary supplement manufacturers and suppliers employing thousands of people. 
In addition, we have among one of the most active consumer constituencies that support the use of dietary supplements in the context of complementary and alternative health care. And I wanted to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership in establishing the complementary and alternative health care and natural foods congressional caucus. I'm, I will be joining the caucus, and I certainly urge others to uh, join the caucus because I think this is a very important issue. Um, many members of Congress serving today were not present in the 103rd Congress when we passed Deshay. And I remember that debate well as having been one of the original supporters of the legislation and having worked closely with the bill's author in the House, our former colleague Bill Richardson. Uh, I, I listened to what you said, Mr. Chairman, and I, I really want to commend you for holding this hearing today because you basically laid out, uh, as you said, uh, my position. We basically share the same position, I think. Uh, and I think this important law deserves an evaluation and assistance from the Congress to make it an even better law for our citizens. In the six short years since Deshaies, Americans have wholeheartedly embraced dietary supplements for the purpose of prevention, reduction of risk, and health promotion. We've seen the establishment of terms like nutraceuticals and functional foods for some of these products. I believe this is a good thing for the country as we transform our health care system. We need to be moving away from a disease care only system and start promoting more wellness and optimal health care policies that include dietary supplements and functional foods. With open minds, we need to be looking at all the ways we can empower our citizens to make good health care choices. Today, your committee is examining several aspects of dietary supplement regulatory policy. And I just wanted to share my views because these issues will probably carry over to the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health, where I also serve. Mr. Chairman, um, as you know and you mentioned, some who are opposed to Deshaies uh, would still call for its outright repeal. But I believe that that would not make sense, nor would it be politically feasible in my opinion. The firestorm that brewed in the Congress in the years of 1992 through 1994 would quickly return. We need to be thoughtful of how we can resolve the issues and challenges faced by dietary supplement manufacturers and consumers, and Congress can help generate mutually beneficial outcomes that protect and empower the public to better health. The FDA, I believe, has an obligation to fulfill the promises embodied in Deshay, and our policy should be to strive to maintain Deshay and it's time for the FDA to live up to the congressional findings we gave them uh, that are contained in the act. I think the most important thing is we have to enforce the law that is currently on the books and let's make sure that the FDA has the resources to do a good job. That, that's an area of key concern to me, enforcement, that the FDA has not done a good job of enforcing the current law because it has not allocated sufficient resources to do a timely execution of the law. For example, we are still waiting for good manufacturing practice regulations for dietary supplements some six years after the passage of Deshaies. And this is not satisfactory. It's placed the dietary supplement industry and consumers in an untenable position. People are confused what to buy, whether the product uh, what, what's contained on the label? Is the consumer getting all the information he or she needs to make an informed decision on how to safely and beneficially use the product? We need to call upon the new administration to promptly release these regulations and get to work on finalizing them. I'm also disappointed that the FDA has not taken action against companies that are delivering products that do not contain what's stated on the label. If it's a question of sufficient resources, then we need to make sure adequate appropriations are made for the FDA to act effectively. And I compliment the trade associations that are making efforts to assure quality. I'm still concerned about the few companies out there that are taking advantage of and confusing the consumer. I know you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the concern that the U.S. will lose its sovereignty on trade matters concerning dietary supplements if it harmonizes U.S. laws with the laws of the European Union or the WTO under the Codex Alimentarius. I believe that we ought to clearly state a position that indicates that we will not sacrifice our sovereignty. Where there are challenges on trade matters concerning dietary supplements, I urge that in a bipartisan manner, we call upon the administration to send experts from the Department of Commerce and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative to assist the current U.S. Codex delegation. I hope that the Congress will move progressively to improve dietary supplement regulatory policy. We can do this by working on ideas that both you, Mr. Chairman, and my colleague from California, Mr. Waxman, have championed before. One constant challenge we face is how we can improve the science and clinical research and development of dietary supplements since they are not regulated as drugs. Borrowing from ideas that were successfully led by Congressman Waxman in the 80s when he co-authored 
the, whack, the Hatch Waxman amendments that gave us the Orphan Drug Act, I introduced H.R. 3001, the Nutraceutical Research and Education Act in the 106th Congress. This legislation attempted to create an Orphan Drug Act incentive type of model to promote clinical R&D for dietary supplements. While my legislation did not pass, I remain committed as a member to explore all the ways we can create incentives and promote clinical research and developments of dietary supplements. I'd also wanted to say, commend you, Mr. Chairman, for introducing H.R. 3306 in the last Congress. This legislation would have amended the Internal Revenue Code to allow the creation of an insurance benefit to cover dietary supplements as a health benefit by an insurance company or employer-sponsored insurance plan. Many of my constituents in New Jersey constantly ask me why dietary supplements and complementary and alternative health care are not always covered by insurance. One of the problems is the tax code. Bringing the tax code up to date with the realities of science and healthcare in the 21st century is an important step. And this simple adjustment you propose will encourage our citizens to greater self-care and wellness and decrease healthcare costs. Furthermore, the integration of health insurance coverage for dietary supplements will promote and empower for dietary supplement industry the highest standards of quality in science and recognize them as true partners in the healthcare product marketplace. I, I, I want to end here, Mr. Chairman, but I look forward to reviewing the testimony given today and working with you and my colleagues to ensure that the public can continue safely and beneficially using dietary supplements. And I also recommend that your committee work closely, as I, I think they have, to assist the White House Commission on complementary and alternative medicine policy. This is a very complex area, but it needs a lot of attention. And I think it's really great that you're having this hearing today and, and trying to address it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Pallone. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried echinacea or uh, vitamin C or uh, products that contain uh, zinc like coldies, and I'm not touting that particular product, but uh, if you've got a cold, that might help. I didn't want to go into all the details because I didn't want to <laughs> suggest to anyone that what they were doing wasn't working. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Any questions of uh, Representative Pallone? Any questions uh, on our side? Thank you very much. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate your support, and we'll, I'll look forward to working with you on this subject. Thank you. And I'd like to see your bill that you had the last Congress. Thank you, sir. Our next uh, panel is Mr. Lauren Israelson. She's supposed to make this type bigger so I can read it, see, but I have to put on these glasses. Uh, Mr. Laurel Israelson, uh, Executive Director of the Utah Natural Products Alliance. Mr. David Seckman, Executive Director of the National Nutritional Foods Association. Mr. Mark Blumenthal, Executive Director of the American Bota Botanical Council. And uh, Mr. Carl Rydell, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Nature's Life, and member of U.S. Delegation Codex Alimentarius Commission on Nutrition and Foods for Special Dietary Uses. Samuel Benjamin, a medical doctor, chairman of Invite Health. Sidney Wolf, MD, uh, director of Health Research Group, public citizen, a public citizen. And Bruce Silverglade, director of Legal Affairs Center for Science and the Public Interest. Thank you all for being here, and I know that a number of you probably have some opening statements. I will you all get seated here. We have a procedure here where we uh, uh, swear on our witnesses uh, uh, on a regular basis, so would you please, uh, once you get seated, stand and raise your right hand. Can you, can you, can you make it all right? <laughs> Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so have you got? Let's see. Okay, I think we'll start at the left end there with uh, Mr. Is Israelson and let you uh, start off. Uh, if you would try to hold your, your comments to uh, five minutes or less, I would, certainly would appreciate it. We have a lot of witnesses today and a lot of questions, so uh, we'd like to have you stick to that if you can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and members of the committee, my name is Lauren Israelson. I'm executive director of the Utah Natural Products Alliance, and we're pleased to have Mr. Cannon on the committee. Utah is indeed a center of dietary supplement manufacturing in the United States. The purpose of the Shea was to establish a badly needed framework for the regulation and sale of dietary supplements in the United States. This was achieved in the following ways. Dietary supplements were defined for the first time as a special class of foods and not as food additives or as new drugs. 
a revised safety standard was created to distinguish new and old dietary ingredients. A new class of benefit statements, commonly called structure function claims, was created. New ingredient labeling and nutrition information requirements for dietary supplements were established for labels and labeling. Good, man good manufacturing practice regulations for dietary supplements were authorized. Section 13 of DSHEA created the Office of Dietary Supplements to be housed in the National Institutes of Health. Now, since the passage of DSHEA, FDA has initiated three major rulemakings. In September of 1997, a final regulation on nutrition labeling for dietary supplements was published. This regulation mandated new label formats, declaration of ingredients, and numerous other requirements to assist consumers in evaluating purchasing decisions with respect to dietary supplements. In January of 2000, FDA published the final regulation on structure function claims. However, there do remain significant areas of disagreement between industry and the agency with respect to what constitute appropriate structure function claims. This appears to be the subject of a, recent, of a new guidance document that the agency is now preparing. In February of 1997, FDA published for comment an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on GMPs for dietary supplements. Uh, this committee has already commented on the slowness of that process. This remains a major disappointment to us that this rulemaking is stalled. We urge the committee to encourage the administration to complete the current OMB review of this proposed regulation and to hasten its early publication. We view this as our number one priority. Adverse event reporting is becoming a very important issue, as you've already mentioned. Both the agency and the majority of the dietary supplement industry agree that a streamlined and improved adverse event reporting system is warranted and needed. We are anxious to see the current bag backlog of AER reports resolved, greater transparency brought to the system, and an opportunity to assess real-time reports to allow us, the industry, to evaluate consumer experience with dietary supplements. Botanicals have become the fastest growing segment of the dietary supplement category and also the most controversial. Many in our industry believe that a number of botanicals could and should be recognized as drug products, either as new drugs, old OTC drugs, or traditional medicines. At the moment, mo these avenues are largely closed to dietary supplement products. The Presidential Commission on Dietary Supplement Labels created by Deshea stated the following. Botanical products should continue to be marketed as dietary supplements when properly labeled. The Commission strongly recommends that FDA promptly establish a review panel for OTC claims for botanical products that are proposed by manufacturers for drug uses. The panel should have appropriate representation of experts on such products. This in no way should limit the sale of such products as dietary supplements, but merely add an additional um, area of claims where science and research can be added to great, add value to consumer experience with these products. Product safety is an issue of great concern to us, to the agency, and to this committee. We understand that FDA has recently announced a contract with the Institute of Medicine to evaluate the safety of dietary supplements. We would very much like to be a part of that process to assure that if a monograph system for the safety evaluation of supplements is developed, that it has the industry's full involvement and cooperation. It may interest this committee to know that the U.S. government is probably now one of the leading sources of dietary supplement research in the world. This is thanks to the funding and creation of the Office of Dietary Supplements and the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. These scientific and research investments will, I believe, pay great dividends in the future health benefits to Americans. I'm pleased to see Dr. Coates of the ODS present today. A uh, quick comment on international issues. I fully share Mr. Burton's and Mr. Waxman's concerns that U.S. laws not be trumped by international agreements. DSHEA has become an important regulatory model for many countries. They are looking to us for guidance with respect to the development and establishment of dietary supplement regulations in probably 30 to 40 countries worldwide. We will resist any efforts by Codex or any other international body to limit the authority of DSHEA or any other U.S. law. In summary, there is much work to be done to fully implement DSHEA. It is my view that the central issue is not whether FDA has authority to regulate this category of products. That was settled by DSHEA. Previous Commissioner Haney noted in her testimony before this committee that DSHEA was enacted to assure access to dietary supplements. With that access now ensured, it is crucial that the necessary implementing regulations be fully completed, especially good manufacturing practices. 
We, what we do not want to see is a repetition of misdirected enforcement policies and overzealous enforcement against dietary supplements. We would support additional funding for FDA to the extent that it supports programs and policies that bring guidance and proper regulation to the category of dietary supplements. We fully recognize that consumer confidence in this class of products is essential to their continued usage. Clearly, we are fully agreed with the agency on these issues. My colleagues and I share these views. We also uh, believe we can work closely with critics of this industry historically as we approach the issue of proper regulation. Um, it is our, my deeply felt belief, having been involved heavily in this DSHE from the beginning, that we have found a structure that will work if proper regulation is brought to bear and proper funding for those regulations is brought to bear. To that extent, we very much want FDA to have the necessary funding for those assignments. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak before the committee. I'll be happy to respond to questions. Thank you, Mr. Israelson. Uh, Mr. Sekman, Sekman. Chairman Burton and honorable members of the Committee on Government Reform, I thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Specifically, I have been asked to discuss the issues and challenges that have arisen for the manufacturers, distributors, and retailers of dietary supplements since the passage of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act in 1994. I am David Sackman, Executive Director and CEO of the National Nutritional Foods Association. NNFA was founded in 1936 and is the oldest and largest trade association in the natural products industry. We represent the interest of more than 3,000 health food stores and 1,000 manufacturers, suppliers, and distributors of health foods, dietary supplements, and related items. For perspective, let me begin with some background information regarding DSHEA. Congress' intent in enacting DSHEA was to help ensure that safe and appropriately labeled products remain available to those who want to use them. In DSHEA, Congress acknowledged the potential for a positive relationship between dietary supplements and good health and indicated the need for additional research to confirm this relationship. As consumers educated themselves about the therapeutic benefits of supplements through a growing body of scientific research and other third-party literature, their purchases of these products increased exponentially. Since the passage of DSHEA, sales of dietary supplements have nearly doubled, going from $8.6 billion in 1994 to more than $16 billion this past year. In the six years since DSHEA's passage, the industry, such as those organizations represented by NFA and others on this panel, have complied with the law by maintaining product safety substantiation and production safeguards to ensure consumers of high quality dietary supplements. NFA's recently implemented good manufacturing practices, GMPs, our GMP program, is an excellent example of an industry taking responsibility for its own products. I am very proud of NFA's efforts to ensure dietary supplement quality and would like to tell a little about the programs that we have established. NFA's Good Manufacturing Practices Certification and True Label Programs are representative of the dietary supplement industry's commitment to providing quality products. Since 1990, NFA's True Label Registration and Random Testing Program has promoted quality assurance, label integrity, and regulatory compliance to our dietary supplement supplier members. Under the True Label Program, random tests are conducted to ensure that what's on the label is in the product. Through the enactment of DSHEA, Congress encouraged the FDA to establish good manufacturing practices for dietary supplements. Today, more than six years later, the FDA has still not issued regulations for GMPs. It was our belief that if the industry established its own uniform GMPs in the absence of a federal rule, it would better prepare manufacturers for the eventual establishment of the regulation. So in 1999, NFA launched a third-party certification program for dietary supplement good manufacturing practices. The centerpiece of our good manufacturing practices certification program is inspections of manufacturing facilities to determine whether NFA specified performance standards are being met. The NFA's GMP program is designed to ensure that all elements of the manufacturing processes are reviewed. On-site inspections of manufacturing facilities cover the following areas and more. Testing of raw ingredients and materials, sanitation controls, quality assurance, laboratory procedures, and staff training and supervision. Only manufacturers who receive NFA's highest compliance ratings are allowed to use NFA's GMP seal on their products. In regards to research, a recent study indicated that more than 40 percent of the adult population in the U.S. is seeking alternative care. NFA recognized that this is crucial for the health and security of all Americans, that objective scientific research is done to determine the effectiveness of complementary and alternative therapies, including the use of dietary supplements. For that reason, NFA has always strongly supported increased funding for the National Institutes of Health Office of Dietary Supplements and National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. We believe these additional funds will help to invest in additional scientific and clinically based research coordinated with NIH 
educate practitioners and consumers through continued education and outreach programs, train additional investigators and invest in career development, and publish scientifically peer-reviewed fact sheets and compile research literature. As to working with the FDA, clearly NNFA and the FDA share a desire to see DSHEA put to its best use. We have always welcomed outreach from the agency when an issue has arisen that jeopardizes the continued marketing of a safe and effective natural products, including dietary supplements. For nearly a decade, in those rare instances where a potential safety issue has arisen, we have been able to draw upon our true label database of more than 25,000 product labels in order to provide the FDA with information and notify those members whose products may be involved. We are appreciative that FDA is seeking the industry's assistance as a safety net and as a resource. As we look to the future, well, it is certainly may be true that the FDA is both underfunded and understaffed. It is not powerless to adequately regulate supplements. The all too familiar assertion that supplements are unregulated is patently untrue. Even the FDA's most recent commissioner, Dr. Jane Haney, has testified before this committee that Deshea provides enough regulatory authority for her agency to protect the public. Our industry is rising to the occasion of its public responsibility with strict compliance with a good law and a meaningful self-regulatory efforts to ensure the safety of its product and accuracy on its labels. With that in mind, it would be most helpful to ensure that FDA is given sufficient support to enforce against those who would take advantage of its inadequate funding. This would allow the FDA to work with Congress to get the resources necessary to fully implement Deshea. We at the NFA look forward to continuing to working responsibly and cooperatively to ensure the safety and quality of dietary supplements. I want to thank the chairman and the members of the committee for the opportunity to present our views here today. Thank you, Mr. Seckman. Uh, is it Seckman or Seekman? Seckman. Seckman. I got it right that time. Mr. Blumenthal. I know I got that right. <laughs> Mr. Blumenthal. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good job. Can you turn the mic on and pull it close to you? N not real close because it sounds like a gun yeah. going off, but someplace. How's that? That sounds okay. good. Thank you for the opportunity to offer my testimony in the area of regulation of herbs, phytomedicines, and related botanically derived products. I am the founder and executive director of the American Botanical Council, or ABC, an independent nonprofit research organization located in Austin, Texas. We were founded in 1988 by a group of medicinal plant scientific experts. At present, ABC's trustees and advisory board members represent 48 scientists, clinicians, and other experts with, with extensive experience in the areas of various sciences related to medicinal plants. Our re members and readers represent thousands of consumers, industry members, and scientists in the U.S. and abroad. Throughout its history, ABC has been a leader in advocating sound, sensible, rational regulation of herbal products, plus truth and honesty in labeling, appropriate GMPs, as well as scientific research and public education on the various benefits and potential risks of these products. As part of our educational efforts, we have published Herbalgram, an acclaimed medicinal plant journal, plus books for healthcare professionals. We are gratified by the positive reception our first book received from the medical community. This book, The Complete German Commission E. Monographs, Therapeutic Guide to Herbal Medicines, was ranked second of all medical books published in 1998. We believe this to be a strong indicator of the need by healthcare professionals for accurate, reliable, responsible information on herbs and related preparations. I have provided extensive materials from this book for the committee. ABC believes that more information about the responsible use of dietary supplements for consumers and healthcare professionals is desirable so long as it is truthful and based on reasonable levels of scientific evidence. To that end, we have also been leaders in the area of providing third-party literature on herbal supplements as provided for in Section 5 of Deshea, with almost 5 million copies of one of our herbal education brochures in print, and I've also provided one of those for the committee. ABC also believes that as much information should be available to consumers on the labels of herbal products, including information that deals with the therapeutic actions, that is the prevention or treatment of disease, of these ingredients, when there is appropriate evidence to support such a claim. Regarding the Commission E. Monographs from Germany, ABC translated, edited, and published them for two primary reasons. One, to provide accurate, reliable information to healthcare professionals and the general public about the risks and benefits of herbs, and second, to serve as a model for regulatory reform in the area of recognizing the therapeutic aspects of herbal products. Now, we're often asked, why Germany? Germany has been the world leader in the development of high-quality herbal and phytomedicinal products and has been a leader in the publication of clinical studies documenting the benefits of herbal preparations. The development of this situation is not accidental and is due in part to the rational system of regulation in Germany. 
Herbal materials used in non-prescription medicines must meet strict quality requirements as established by the German Pharmacopeia. Second, herbs are evaluated by the Commission E, a panel of experts appointed by the German counterpart of the FDA. These experts review all the available evidence to assess the safety and efficacy of these herbs. The Commission's findings are published as monographs in, German, in the German equivalent to the Federal Register and are printed as package inserts for herbal dietary supplement pro herbal di dietary products over here as herbal drug products over there. These include dosage, indication, but in, most importantly, the government-approved uses. The Commission used a doctrine of reasonable certainty in establishing its conclusions about efficacy and was more conservative in assessing safety. We believe it is imperative to recognize that much of the concern about safety of herbal products in the United States, while sometimes warranted, is often exaggerated because occasional reports of adverse reactions are not countervailed with an officially recognized benefit. We believe that herbs should be reviewed for their benefits and potential risks, but that this evaluation should be rational and appropriate to these products and their uses as has been conducted in Germany. We also believe that the current system for the evaluation of OTC, over OTC drugs is not workable for most herbal products, thus requiring the addition of a Commission E type system to be established. Further, ABC still supports and maintaining the dietary supplement status of herbs and related products with the ability to make structure function claims under Deshay. Reliable information is the key to the responsible use of these products. It is important that consumers and healthcare professionals understand that there is a growing body of impressive scientific evidence based on clinical studies that supports the rational uses of herbs and phytomedicines. ABC is working to help professionals answer the growing number of questions that consumers ask their doctors and pharmacists. To this end, ABC is currently completing a new set of monographs on the therapeutics of 30 leading herbs in the marketplace uh, to be published as continuing medical education for healthcare professionals. This project is being accredited by the Texas Medical Association, the Texas Nurses Association, the College of Pharmacy at the University of Texas of Austin, and the American Dietetic Association. ABC seeks and invites full collaborations with government bodies such as the Office of Dietary Supplements and organizations in the areas of professional and public education on herbs. We support the role and mission of ODS as an advisor to the federal government on health benefits of herbs and other dietary supplements. ABC also supports the mission of the FDA in regulating the quality, safety, and benefits of dietary supplements. We also support the need for FDA to enforce existing regulations regarding the manufacture and labeling of supplement products and the appropriateness of their structure function claims. We believe that time is right to consider ways to expand the possibilities for labeling of therapeutic information on herbal products, and we look forward to working with all interested parties to help increase public and professional information in this area. I thank you for this opportunity to present our views. Thank you, Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Rydell. Thank you, Chairman. That's Riedel. I think it goes back to the movie Grease. I was uh, thinking yes, Riedel. I, I hear that a lot. I, <laughs> I, nobody remembers that movie? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, Mr. Riedel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Tierney, and members of the committee. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, represent not only my company, Nature's Life, which is a 30-year-old family-owned company in Southern California. We sell to all 50 states, plus about a dozen foreign countries as well as the National Nutritional Foods Association, uh, for which I have uh, done different international regulatory efforts, including Codex Alimentarius work for the last several years. Uh, Codex Alimentarius, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for eloquently recapping what they do, uh, stands for food law. And uh, they do involve 165 different countries uh, currently participating in Codex. It has two simple mandates. Number one, to improve food safety by developing standards. And number two, to enhance international food trade by global acceptance of those standards. It is the world's premier international standard setting body for foods and also for vitamin and mineral supplements. And is codified in several international trade agreements to which the U.S. is a signatory. When Codex standards are published, the U.S. is committed to evaluate these new standards against current U.S. laws and regulations and, through normal rulemaking, make revisions as appropriate. The primary goal of this process, commonly called harmonization, is to enhance the international trade by making the regulations of different trading countries more similar, thus reducing technical barriers to trade. Codex has been discussing guidelines for the definition, safety, and labeling of vitamin and mineral supplements since 1993 in detail. 
And the 48-page presentation I have provides uh, background, history, procedures, and the current issues relating to Codex, which was for your reference. Um, also some more detailed recommendations for you. In terms of the current issues, the U.S., along with very few other countries, enjoys relatively unrestricted availability to a wide range of dietary supplements. This important health freedom was successfully championed by Congress as the Deche in 1994. Most countries around the world, however, regulate any dietary supplement as a drug if it contains ingredients other than essential nutrients or nutrient amounts in excess of the nominal RDA levels. The current codex drafts for dietary supplement standards are much more restrictive than current U.S. law because of the restrictive mindset of many of the codex participants from other countries. Some U.S. consumers mistakenly believe that if this draft becomes an approved codex standard, that it will automatically become a U.S. regulation, thus restricting the availability of supplements here in the U.S. This concern is unfounded and virtually impossible under current U.S. law, both because of the codex acceptance procedure and because of the protections that Congress added through the Reform Act, Modernization Act, FDA Modernization Act. Another concern if the restrictive codex standards are approved, however, is the U.S. dietary supplement suppliers will be severely hampered in their ability to export and sell supplements in other countries. This means that not only incomes and jobs here in the U.S. will be eliminated or reduced, but also that health-conscious consumers in other countries will not have that same health freedom of choice that we enjoy here. This concern is not only real, but likely. Um, the solutions that I recommend to Congress Number one, continue the active participation in Codex by U.S. delegates in all the committees, but with two caveats. Number one, much more aggressive advocacy of Deche by U.S. delegates in all the Codex committees, specifically the Nutrition Committee and the Food Labeling Committee, to ensure that the Codex standards adequately provide for consumer health freedoms. And number two, much more monitoring and intervention specifically, including attending meetings by Department of Commerce and the United States Trade Representatives to ensure that the codex standards liberalize and do not restrict international trade and dietary supplements. Finally, um, the U.S. Codex Office, uh, although they are doing a very good job, I believe, the comprehensive annual report to, Commerce on all, to Congress on all U.S. codex activity should be expanded to include all the new standards that have been approved by codex, including all new work authorized, the form of acceptance of all of these codex standards, and the potential implications of each new and developing standard, so that you are better informed and able to make decisions and, and supervise the work of the U.S. Codex Office. Also to upgrade their website uh, to include all that current information on codex. Codex is an 800-pound gorilla. We can't ignore it. We don't always like what it does. We can't always control it. But we do need to continue working with it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Redell? Yes. I got that right? Okay. Mr. Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin. Can you pull the mic closer and turn? I think it needs to be turned on. How's that? That's, oh, that's there, great. We, there we that's go. Great. <laughs> um, I, I kept practicing what I was going to say to you all the way down on the plane from New York. Um, and I think I'm going to change just a little bit of what I've written down in testimony because I'm not a person who's been involved in codex legislation other than to read about what's going on. But I'll tell you what I am. I'm, I'm a principal in a company, a very small company that makes multivitamins and minerals. But primarily, I'm a practicing pediatrician. I'm a professor of pediatrics and complementary and alternative medicine at a medical school in New York. And I... Uh, I've been a physician for about 25 years. I've worked in the South Bronx of New York, the hovels of urban and rural Mexico, and in more affluent Phoenix, Arizona. And during that time, the one thing that I have found to hold true is that people, uh, regardless of their background and their education, have the ability to make intelligent decisions for themselves. And if they are empowered to do so, they'll always make the right decisions if they're provided appropriate information. And I think that the FDA always needs to be sure, and I recognize the incredible burden that they have with regard to protecting public safety, must nevertheless recognize what their goal is, and that's to facilitate good outcome in health care in this country and to facilitate individuals to exercise their personal freedom to make appropriate choices in health care. Uh, having said that, and recognizing the importance of the cost of care, which is accelerating 
trading here in the United States with the, uh, uh, what is it, some $2.6 trillion budget for health care uh, projected uh, by the federal government by 2010. There are numerous strategies and issues that I know all of you in Congress need to grapple with, but one of them has got to be to encourage the use of uh, good nutritional habits and good use and appropriate use of nutritional supplements, including minerals, vitamins, and herbal products, not just to maintain a state of health as is set forth by the RDA, but to promote, uh, uh, to promote optimal health and to focus on prevention. You know, medical schools uh, are struggling to train students in a discipline that is rapidly changing. And I can tell you from personal experience that nutrition, health promotion, and disease prevention most often take a backseat to much more glamorous high-tech modalities. Uh, and and yet I receive calls daily from physicians and patients, uh, and physicians admitting that patients know more about what's going on, that they want information about it, and that their patients are using dietary supplements. And I get lots of incredible calls from patients, uh, and from patients that I see uh, with regard to results as a result of using nutritional or dietary supplements. I'd like to give a few examples, one that I did not write down, but that Mr. Waxman mentioned and apparently was of some concern to the FDA and where I, dis and where I disagree. Uh, St. John's Ward. Uh, there is a patient of mine in Long Island uh, whose uh, husband is self-employed. They have an average income, I think, annually of about $38,000 a year. Regrettably, there is no insurance available for them. They are uninsured, working uninsured people. Uh, this lady is a wonderful person who works at nights in a diner. She's very depressed for appropriate reasons. Uh, it is very expensive to get mental health assistance. And her husband and, incidentally, both she and her husband think that uh, the use of uh, any kind of prescription product with regard to mental health would be a sign of craziness, that uh, they don't acknowledge uh, the need for uh, potentially seeing a healthcare professional with regard to the mental health issues. However, she purchased St. John's Ward because she read about it uh, on the internet, and it made a significant difference in her life. While I don't think that uh, it, it alone uh, is the best treatment, it gave her access to something that she didn't have at a cost that was reasonable. It allowed her to do something. I recognize that the FDA has appropriate concerns about St. John's Ward, but they also need to see the woods from the trees. There are millions of people who don't have access to more expensive prescription products, and this offers a rational and reasonable alternative. Nothing is perfect, but you need to look at that from a global perspective. Here are some other patient stories, though. A patient that I've seen with moderate hypertension who was on an antihypertensive drug but still required additional intervention and who was able to lower his blood pressure further to an acceptable level by adding 500 milligrams of vitamin C once a day. Or the patient with angina whose favorable response to nitrates, nitroglycerin, was attenuated over time such that he would require additional and more expensive prescribed medications, uh, but was uh, able to stay on nitrates longer because he learned how his own vitamin E could help. And indeed, by adding vitamin E, he learned that he could decrease that attenuation effect. The 11-year-old who has exercise-induced asthma and found that instead of steroids and inhalants, he was able to substantially decrease his medications by using vitamin C and lycopene supplements. The 55-year-old male with non-insulin-dependent diabetes who uh, took vitamin E, vanadium, chromium, and bitter melon, and as a result was able to wean himself off much more expensive medications. I could probably go on and on, and that's not appropriate because I'm already over time. I would only point out that in addition to this, preventive issues are extremely important. Vitamin E has been shown to decrease the incidence of prostatic cancer and the mortality associated with it. Selenium has been associated with a reduction in total cancer mortality, total cancer incidence, and the incidence of lung, colorectal, and prostate cancers. I would only add this one last thing. Uh, I believe that there is a great need to control quality of product, but I think everyone has talked about that already. I think that we need to be sure about the purity of the products that are produced and that what is on the label indeed is in the product, and I recognize the importance of that. I encourage the FDA to consider a better enforcement of Deshaies as already has been mentioned, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Your practice on the way down was well, uh, well, well done. Thank you. I thought you made a nice statement. Dr. Wolf. A former college roommate, now an investment banker, told me two years ago that herbal dietary supplement comp companies were a hot investment item because they do not have to spend money for research to show that the products are safe and effective. In contrast to the hundred million, some companies would say more, it takes to get a pharmaceutical through the FDA drug review process, 
Several people in the industry have estimated to me that it takes a mere, lots of money, but a mere three to five million dollars to get a supplement to the market. The legal cover for this profitable investment strategy comes from Diche. I thank you for the opportunity to review the increasing evidence that this 1994 law is dangerous for people in this country. American Association of Poison Control Centers currently and correctly categorizes herbals, dietary supplements as pharmaceutical products in their categorization of toxicity that they collect from poison control centers since they do have pharmacologic activity. For drugs, the FDA has two opportunities to collect data on safety. One, legally mandated pre-market safety studies, and secondly, post-marketing adverse reports. For dietary supplements, neither of these is required. FDA has estimated that about one out of ten adverse reactions to prescription drugs are reported to the agency, most from the pharmaceutical companies, 90 percent because they're required by law to do so. For dietary supplements, it's likely that this is less than one percent of re reactions are reported to FDA, one reason being that there's no legal obligation on the part of the manufacturers to do so. Every year, the American Association of Poison Control Centers publishes an annual report in the American Journal of, Epi of Emergency Medicine tabulating the number of adverse reactions reported by its toxic exposure surveillance system. Uh, the figure that I've compiled on page two from their data shows that from 1994 through 1999, the number of such reports each year for dietary supplements was 35,400. Contrast this to only roughly 3,000 reports, same interval of time, uh, sent to the FDA. M 10 times higher for the reports sent to the American Association of Poison Control Centers. This doesn't even include a large number of reports for botanicals, which they have not yet categorized into commercial versus non-commercial uh, botanicals. Nor does it include adverse reactions that don't result in emergency room conditions or emergency room hospitalizations. I also have shown a chart here where you can see there's practically an identity other than one CH3, a methyl group, being substituted for an H group. Ephedrine is really otherwise the same as phenylpropanolamine, now off the market. Uh, Well-documented concerns with cardiac arrhythmias from ephedrine also occur with other family drugs such as amphetamine and phenylpropanolamine. The son of one of my colleagues, Dr. Randy Sassage, who is a third-year resident in internal medicine at Barnes-Jewish, the main teaching hospital at Washington University, within a seven-month period had two patients admitted to the coronary care unit after serious acute adverse reactions to Herbalife. One a woman in her late 50s presented in the emergency room with ventricular tachycardia. She'd been using Metabolife. She was admitted to the coronary care unit for observation. Second, a woman in her late 30s suffered a heart attack and cardiac arrest while using a dietary supplement. She suffered brain damage. A third person not admitted to the coronary care unit, a nurse, had rapid heart rate. Shortly after using dietary supplements, she was observed with an electrocardiogram. FDA commissioned two reviews uh, to be done of the 140 adverse reactions it had been reported to it, from not from the American uh, Association of Poison Control Centers, but just through the MedWatch system. Uh, though in both of the reviews, they found 10 deaths. Uh, in the first, 17 cases of hypertension, 13 people with palpitations or fast heartbeat, 10 strokes. The other review, looking at more at the arrhythmias, found 10 cases of sudden death also, 9 arrhythmias, and 23 more possible arrhythmias. The FDA ban on PPA was based on a much smaller number of serious adverse reaction reports in their files than now exists, even with the extraordinary underreporting for ephedra. I don't have time to talk about some other problems. They're in the testimony. Uh, a number of studies have shown that a, a number of different herbs can interfere significantly with the anti-blood clotting properties of Coumadin, increase them so that people who are, should be taking blood thinners such as Coumadin may have their blood too thin and may risk bleeding. There are some case reports of serious bleeds in people who took, in addition to their blood thinner, a uh, herbal supplement that had unknown quantities of unknown contents that have anticoagulant effects. Uh, the president of the American Society of Anesthesiology has recently said, quote, it is very troubling to see our patients use products that they believe will, prove it, will provide a health benefit, but in fact may jeopardize their lives during surgery if they don't tell us what they're taking. 
Right now, legislation could be introduced combined with the right signals during the FDA appropriation process, and a number of people have previously mentioned the issue, does FDA have enough funding, and a strong version of the belated, I think I share with all of you, the fact that this thing is taking too long to come out, the belated GMP regulations to rapidly lessen the dam damage being done by this dietary supplement industry wish list masquerading as and having the force of federal law. Improvements include mandatory adverse event reporting, requirements for all dietary supplement manufacturers, uh, mandatory warning labels for risks, requirements for company and product registration and identification of the raw ingredients and the source by country for each of the ingredients in each product. This latter requirement is necessary to ensure that BSE contaminated recycled cow organs do not appear on the shelves in this country as dietary supplements. That's bovine spongiform encephalopathy. In addition, mandated funds are necessary to implement and enforce the GMP regulation that will hopefully be finalized soon. In addition, FDA should be app appropriated the funds to purchase the entire dietary supplement database of the American Association of Poison Control Centers. At present, only the ephedra part has been purchased. When the first member of this committee or of Congress or their families has a stroke, a far fatal cardiac arrhythmia, or some other life-threatening adverse reaction to dietary supplements, per perhaps there will be a belated reconsideration of the damage done by Deshaies. I say this not in a casual way because every single law that's been passed in the history of the Food and Drug Administration concerning safety of products only occurred after various kinds of disasters. The law will then either be significantly modified or repealed so that pre-market safety and efficacy testing becomes the preferable alternative to post-marketing human experimentation. Until then, trust the snake oil companies. Not all of the companies are snake oil companies, but as many have stated previously, there are some snake oil companies there. Their only concern is your health. And I've attached 26 articles we've published in our monthly newsletter called Worst Pills, Best Pills News, which is the monthly supplement to our book, Worst Pills, on various problems that have occurred usually resulting in recalls or warnings on various kinds of herbal supplements uh, over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Uh, Mr. Silverglade. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, since the enactment of Deshaies, there has been both good news and bad news to report. First, the good news is that more and more Americans are getting the message that dietary supplements can play an important role in maintaining good health and can provide a valuable adjunct to conventional medical treatment. The bad news is that benefits have not been established for many supplements now in the market. Some of these products may be unsafe, and some consumers may not be able to make the best choices to promote their own health. As Americans increasingly rely on supplements, it's critical that Congress ensure that such products are safe before they're sold and that label claims are valid. Unfortunately, Deshaies has made it difficult to achieve these dual objectives. Under the law, dietary supplements are presumed safe until the FDA can prove that they pose a significant or unreasonable risk. While assigning the FDA this new enforcement burden, Congress failed to provide the agency with additional resources for this purpose. Thus, as a practical matter, the FDA has not been able to effectively utilize its enforcement authority. Instead, the agency has relied on inadequate remedies, such as issuing public warnings that may be heard by some people and not by others, or by requesting voluntary recalls that may or may not be heeded. The wisdom of this approach must be seriously questioned, given Americans' reliance on dietary supplements to protect their health. While good manufacturing practice regulations will help ensure potency and reduce the chances that products are contaminated, they will not ensure that the underlying ingredient is safe for its intended use. Moving to the area of labeling, DSHA permits producers to make so-called structure function claims concerning health benefits without obtaining FDA authorization. Many of these claims are poorly substantiated because they have not been submitted for review prior to marketing, nor are they based on established scientific monographs. Furthermore, as the General Accounting Office noted in a report last summer, consumers incorrectly view structure function claims as a claim to reduce the risk of or treat a disease. GAO thus concluded that consumers may attempt to treat a disease with a product that is not capable of producing the benefit. For example, one of the most popular herbs, garlic, has been widely promoted for maintaining heart health and or healthy cholesterol levels. 
difficult claims include statements such as regular consumption of garlic may help promote healthy heart function and regulate cholesterol levels. I have uh, several samples uh, here today. Uh, the GAO has found that such claims imply disease prevention. However, a scientific literature review released last October by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality concluded that garlic, quote, does not attempt to offer long-term protection against cardiovascular disease, unquote. Yet we are still able to purchase garlic supplements in a local drugstore just yesterday, and all of them, not just this company, but almost a half a dozen, continue to make such claims. Let me talk just for a moment about possible solutions. DSHEA is having a negative impact not just on consumers, but on the industry as well. Problems related to dietary supplement safety have been widely reported in the media. There was reference to a cover story in U.S. News & World Report, for example. Such reports, coupled with increasing skepticism about unfounded claims, may explain why some sales data indicate that supplement sales seem to have reached a plateau. It is therefore in the interest of both industry and consumers to support a systematic, comprehensive review of dietary supplement safety and efficacy. The results of such a study would provide greater legitimacy for supplements that are truly beneficial and could lead to the removal from the marketplace of any dangerous or ineffective products that tarnish the reputation of the entire industry. Now this result may be a bitter pill for some companies, but like a supplement that may taste bitter, the long-term benefits will be rewarding for the industry as a whole. The U.S. National Academy of Sciences is beginning an FDA-funded project to develop seven prototype monographs on leading dietary supplement ingredients. Congress should provide additional funds for this project so that it can be expanded to cover all of the most popular dietary supplements now on the market. Now, this would normally conclude my testimony, but today we're in a global economy and we need to review activities of international regulatory bodies that may impact on policies set by Congress and the FDA. We are specifically concerned about the adverse impact that standards developed by a UN body called the Codex Alimentarius Commission may have on regulatory requirements established by Congress and the executive branch, and we're pleased that the committee is investigating this matter. Prior to 1995, Codex standards had no legal effect in the U.S., but since the formation of the World Trade Organization, Codex standards can potentially have an impact on domestic regulatory policies because the U.S. government can be sued at the WTO for maintaining regulatory requirements that exceed them. While it is true that nothing in the WTO agreement requires that governments accept Codex standards, the threat of a WTO challenge certainly puts pressure on the U.S. Let's say, for example, that the FDA finalizes good manufacturing practice regulations. Another country, let's say, for example, India, which has been quite active in the Codex Alimentarius, uh, that companies in India produce herbal supplements who don't like the FDA's good manufacturing practice regulations. They could uh, ask the government of India to challenge the FDA rules at the World Trade Organization as a trade barrier uh, because current Codex requirements do not include such regulations. If that happens and the U.S. loses the suit, which it has done before at the WTO, the entire FDA regulatory scheme for GMPs could be thrown in disarray after all the work that the agency and the Congress and the Office of Management Budget has, has done on the issue. And unfortunately, the U.S. has not fared very well at semi-annual semi meetings of the Codex Alimentarius Commission. And the U.S. cannot say that it controls the standards development process at that organization very effectively. Therefore, the operation of the WTO agreement should be reevaluated, and these problems should be taken into account in any new trade agreements. We wish to thank the committee again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Silverglade. We'll now proceed with uh, questions of the panel. I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Israelson. Uh, the dietary supplement industry is a big industry in Utah, and if Codex uh, restricted international trade, how would that affect uh, the economy of Utah? A number of our companies are significant exporters, and if they're limited in their ability to sell in a number of foreign markets that uh, do follow Codex guidance, that would clearly have an economic impact on our state. At the moment, difficult for me to judge what the numbers would be, uh, but significant would, would be the right word. Do, do you have any idea how many people are employed in this industry in uh, Utah? Uh, we believe there's something in the range, directly and indirectly, about 10,000 people. About 10,000 people. Uh, what do you think the FDA should do about uh, ephedra? I was afraid you were going to ask me that question. 
I may ask all of you that question. Uh, ephedra remains one of our most difficult issues. It would be my proposal that the guidance, draft guidance document, which has been prepared by industry after a great deal of deliberation, uh, be reconsidered by the agency. And I think the single most important issue are the uh, dosage amounts of ephedra permitted per dose and per day. I believe the rest of the guidance is largely um, in the range of general agreement. I don't want to speak for the agency, probably ask them the same question. Um, I think we're, we're down to numbers at this point. Have, have, are you familiar with the study that was done? It has not yet been published by Columbia University and Harvard University. It was a six-month study on the efficacy uh, and safety of uh, uh, herbal uh, ephedrine, caffeine in, in the area of weight loss. I'm aware of the study. I have not read it. Yeah. Uh, I have read a synopsis of it, as my staff has as well, and it's shown if properly taken according to the directions that uh, ephedra uh, is not harmful. And I hope that uh, it will be widely disseminated as soon as it comes out so everybody in the industry and everybody who opposes ephedra can see what this study did because it wasn't some fly-by-night organization or organizations that did the study. Mm. It was uh, Harvard and, uh, and Columbia, two highly regarded institutions. Uh, what are your views about the Pearson versus Shalala case and the FDA's actions since that case? Are you familiar with that? I am. Uh, my first observation is that it appears to have been a significant resource drain within the agency. Uh, I'm concerned about that because it's distracted time and resource from many of the other issues that we discussed today in terms of moving GMPs and other important regulatory guidance um, policy forward. Uh, I think everyone here, myself included, are ardent supporters of uh, free speech and the rights provided by the First Amendment. Um, I have some personal concerns as to consumer understanding of the messages created by Pearson versus Shalala. That's a personal perspective, is that as we go forward, I think consumers are looking for and do um, expect and deserve messages that they have confidence in. Qualified health claims are by definition that qualified. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that consumers have difficulty judging uh, how qualified is qualified, I'm afraid that it may <laughs> actually uh, undermine confidence consumers have in, in supplement claims. Uh, Mr. Seekman, I got that right that time. Seekman. Seekman. Okay. Seekman. Mr. Seekman. Uh, do you think the industry overall is responsible and has uh, sanitary and quality products? Uh, we completely agree with that. Um, and as you indicated in my testimony, the uh, initiation of our, our the industry's own self-regulatory efforts of our GMP programs, I think, is a clear indication of that. Hmm. How will uh, NNFA's good manufacturing practices program be affected by the FDA's establishment of standards? Well, when the proposed regulation comes out, we're going to compare our standards to what the FDA is proposing. I think we're going to be something, see something that's very similar to the NFA's program with some adjustments. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, industry, when the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking came out in 1997, the comments were made. I think the uh, agency learned a lot and uh, is coming up with their proposed regs. And I think. What NFA did in the meantime was come out with our standards and we'll actually have uh, manufacturers who will be better prepared when the final GMP regulations are issued by the FDA to be able to meet those standards. Well, have, have, you, have you sent uh, your standards uh, to the FDA for review to see if uh, they would incorporate those into theirs? We have had uh, previous meetings with them and shared our standards with them and the FDA has been uh, very open about receiving those and, and taking them into consideration as they develop their own proposed regulations. Okay. Is the uh, BSE or mad cow disease issue going to be a concern uh, to this country uh, with dietary supplements? It's not going to be in relationship to dietary supplements, and I think there's a lot of misinformation that's out there currently about that. There's never been a case of BSE in this country. There's never been a link to any dietary supplement in this country or globally with BSE and, and dietary supplements. So I think it's just an issue of trying to get the information out there. Uh, the FDA and the industry has worked uh, long and hard since the 19, early 1990s. FDA has issued several guidances. The industry has followed those guidances. And we worked uh, together to make sure that this is not an issue or a concern, a safety issue to the, the public. In fact, our association just recently issued a, a BSE guidance and our standards operating procedures to auto manufacturers just to make sure they're all following the same procedure. 
measures. Mr. Tierney, you have questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. W or Dr. Wolf and, and Mr. Silverglade, let me just ask you, I, I shouldn't think that the concepts of safety and consumer confidence or industry success would be mutually exclusive concepts uh, to consider. Can you tell me uh, what your knowledge is in terms of what testing has been done to determine the risks uh, of these products? You know, has there been a, a great field of studies on this uh, that would meet the uh, satisfactory level for consumers to have confidence? Um, about a year and a couple months ago, uh, Dr. Godfrey Oakley, who was head of the birth defect section at the Centers for Disease Control, and I wrote a letter to the FDA to try and stop them from their dangerous proposal to allow women with nausea and vomiting of the first trimester of pregnancy or with edema of pregnancy to be promoted uh, herbals or dietary supplements for those two purposes. We argued that these are conditions for which, because of pregnancy, you shouldn't be giving people drugs, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, uh, which have not been tested. And during a hearing which the FDA convened after that, they actually responded to our request and stopped those kinds of uh, foolish and dangerous plans. During a hearing, someone from the Herbal Drugs Association uh, was asked what fraction of the several hundred drugs that are listed in their monographs as being safe have actually been tested adequately for pregnancy? And he sort of paused and said, very, very few. So just on that one note, for starters, products that are often promoted explicitly or otherwise for pregnant women have not been tested to see whether they cause birth defects. Uh, there have been some articles published recently about the leading 10 selling by sales herbal products. And if you look at carefully at all the randomized controlled trials on the effectiveness of those drugs, those products, two or at the most three of them actually have good evidence of effectiveness. They all have dangers, as all chemicals do. And if the effectiveness were significant and proven, uh, the benefits might outweigh the risk. But if there isn't any acceptable evidence of effectiveness, then whatever dangers there are are risks without concomitant benefits. I think generally we have learned much more from adverse reaction reports when particularly they occur in a large number of people than we have from any kind of rigorous safety testing that's occurred. I mean, if you go back 100 years ago, the source of many of what we now call very acceptable pharmaceuticals were botanicals or herbals. And that's fine, and I don't see any problem with sourcing for human therapeutic benefit products out of these. The difference is that they need to be subjected to test to make sure that they are safe using randomized controlled trials if appropriate, which is usually appropriate, and, uh, th and, and effective. And I think most of the products on the market have not been. It will be very interesting to see, and I support all the efforts to do at government expense, as it turns out, proper studies to evaluate existing literature and to do new studies. And I think that some of these products will turn out to be beneficial. I have little doubt about that. I think that most of them will not. And to the extent that it not only defrauds, defrauds people, but also subjects them to risks without concomitant benefit. I don't think that's a good idea. Bruce? Well, I would concur with what Dr. Wolf said and just add that two points. One is that the, for the individual consumer, it, it's not possible for them to know which products have been uh, tested adequately for safety and which have not. Uh, they're all on the market with claims that they're safe. And, and contrary to what Dr. Benjamin says, I don't believe that the average consumer uh, can go to the store shelf and judge which ones are appropriate to take and which ones aren't, which ones are based on adequate safety studies and which ones are not. Um, I'd also just note, when it comes to uh, Chinese herbals, uh, many practitioners of, of Chinese herbal medicine are very upset about what American companies are doing by selling Chinese herbs for non-traditional purposes, while a particular herb may have been very effective in, in China for thousands of years to treat a particular condition. Uh, that says nothing about whether it's safe and effective to be used in the United States for jet lag or dieting or things that it was never used for in China. With respect to the study that uh, the chairman mentioned earlier, uh, do you happen to know uh, whether or not that study was sponsored by industry or by an independent source? 
You, you're talking about the Harvard Columbia study on exactly. federal. I, I do not know that, but it would be very surprising, regardless of who does it. I mean, wonderful institutions can do good studies, and some of them can do studies that aren't very well designed. I mean, earlier studies on phenylpropanolamine indicated that it was okay, and when a more rigorous study was done, it turned out that it was really quite dangerous in terms of strokes, and I've pointed out the chemical similarity between the two. I would be shocked, given what we know from well-documented case reports of people who've had cardiac arrhythmias and strokes and other problems right after using ephedra. I'd be shocked to find out that it turned out to be safe. It may be effective for a short term. Uh, none of the dietary drugs, whether they're over-the-counter, former PPA drugs, prescription, or ephedra have ever been shown on a long-term basis to uh, have weight reduction. So I think that on both the safety and effectiveness side, uh, for a public health purpose, namely long-term effectiveness and safety, I would be very surprised, despite Harvard and Columbia's names being on it, to, that that study is designed in such a way to really definitively answer the question and overwhelm all of the other evidence that's been accumulating for decades on these drugs. Thank you. I'll continue if you like. Uh, let's start with Mr. Silverglade. Uh, what do you recommend about ephedra? Uh, the Center, Center for Science and the Public Interest has no uh, specific recommendations on ephedra, and as a lawyer, I'm, I'm not going to uh, restrain myself uh, from uh, giving anything uh, that could be uh, resemble medical advice. I would just note that while ephedra was used in, in various forms in China for asthma and respiratory congestion, it's sold in the United States for uh, weight loss, bodybuilding, uh, fatigue, and other purposes for which it wasn't traditionally used for in China. And while it may be safe in China, the dosage and, and frequency uh, of administration is different in the United States, and that's where some of these safety problems uh, derive from. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wolf, uh, what do you recommend about ephedra? We recommend the same thing about ephedra that we recommended in a petition about phenylpropanolamine. It should come off the market. There's really very little difference. The fact that ephedra is regulated or not able to be as well regulated because it falls under DSHEA as PPA did falling under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, should not be a barrier in the face of all the evidence uh, to taking it off the market. Dr. Benjamin, how do you feel about it? You, could you turn the... Hello. I cannot support uh, the use of ephedra. I think that it is a very effective tool uh, for some things. You, Ma Huang, when used in China, is used for uh, uh, acute bronchitis or asthma. But I think that there's, unfortunately, as with any product, always room for a considerable amount of abuse. And with regard to weight loss, while I'm sure that there is weight loss, it's a thermogenic product, nevertheless, uh, I have great concerns about its potential for complications in how similar it is to phenylpropylalamine. And last but not least, I have a problem in general with any product that uh, attempts to induce weight loss over the short run. Uh, we've seen very often that most people, after they've uh, taken any kind of product uh, for short-term short weight loss, in the end, either gain all of the weight back that they had to begin with at a much more rapid clip, which is incidentally more dangerous, or for that matter, end up most usually at a higher weight after therapy than they did when they started. So regrettably, while uh, I do believe that people and uh, can make intelligent decisions, I think there are some products that offer considerable danger, and uh, I cannot support its use. Mr. Rydell, how do you feel? Uh, do you recommend about uh, ephedra? Um, ephedra, I would almost like to echo Mr. Silverglade and um, Dr. Benjamin um, regarding its historical use in China and its use here in the U.S., which is largely inappropriate. I think perhaps a recommendation, and my company does not sell it. I regard it as a stimulant, um, and I think that's the way it should be labeled. Uh, I think one of the ways the FDA could address it is to define the term energy which is what is sold for here in the U.S. is primarily is an energy-producing dietary supplement. And if the FDA defined energy and restricted its use, I think that it would perhaps resolve a significant part of the problem. Mr. Blumenthal. 
Well, I think that ephedra needs to be dealt with because here we are having a conversation about herbs in general, and ephedra seems to be dominating the conversation. Uh, we believe in scientific research. We support the uh, petition that was uh, filed last fall by some of the trade associations to, um, to FDA to promote more research with the Office of Dietary Supplements, the National uh, Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine and FDA and industry to resolve this issue from a scientific perspective. Uh, we acknowledge, for example, in Germany, at the Commission E. Monographs, for example, since that's part of my testimony, that over there, ephedra is approved at dosages up to 300 milligrams per day, which is fairly significant, uh, for bronchodilation in ca cases of asthma or uh, hay fever, that kind of thing. Uh, that's the only limited indication for the herbal preparation in Germany. We believe that scientific research should be carried out, it should be evaluated impartially, and then the results uh, should drive the regulatory situation. Mr. Siegman, how do you feel? Um, we agree uh, with what Mark with the idea of, of, of further research that should be done on this and supported that in the past. Additionally, we have also indicated our our belief that it, uh, we should have a dosage limit, and as, as Lauren had mentioned before, uh, that we're very, almost all the associations have agreed on not to exceed 100 milligrams per day, and it should be limited as usage for persons 18 ages, 18 years old or over. How about you, Mr. Israelson? Same opinion as last time, actually. Uh, I'll just restate it. I think the committee may be benefited by reviewing the guidance document that was generated by industry, which is very detailed with respect to labeling, cautions, warnings, uh, dosage levels. A lot of thought and care went into trying to design something that would try and accommodate all views and perspectives on this. Uh, I think that's the current state of the art with regard to proper dosing and labeling. And I think the agency and industry will sit down and look at that document. There may be a basis to find a resolution. Well, I thank you. Let's go to the next question. We'll start with you, Mr. Israelson. What do consumers need to keep in mind as they look to choose uh, between vitamins and botanicals? Between vitamins and botanicals? Yeah. To choose one or the other. What do you feel about that? At least the consumer. If you're trying to educate consumers. I would encourage them to use both, Mr. Horn. People use vitamins and, and herbals uh, differently in my judgment. Uh, vitamins have a long tradition and history of use as uh, nutritional supplements. Botanicals have a longer tradition um, as therapy for prevention and for other purposes. Um, my hope is that consumers will, uh, are clear in their expectation of what the product can do. Uh, typically vitamins um, are taken for long-term care. Botanicals, on the other hand, often have shorter-term benefits. Uh, consumer education is, is fundamental. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I think it's in terms of making a choice between the two, it's very much a question of what their hope and expectation is for the, for the outcome. Do you agree with that, Mr. Siegman? I do. I think it should be a choice of the individuals to take either or, or both. Mr. Blumenthal? I think, I think it's a question of both and. I couldn't hear the last part. Can you hear me? I think it's a both-and issue. For example, I take vitamins and minerals and herbal products, uh, both. Uh, I take vitamins just to en enhance my nutritional wellness. Uh, I take herbs for specific purposes. For example, I'm over 50. I'm taking saw palmetto. I've been diagnosed with BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, I know that there's been over 18 clinical studies that have been meta-analyzed and published in the Journal of the American Medical Association about the safety and benefits of saw palmetto. Under Deshaies, by the way, uh, you can only make a claim that it helps maintain uh, prostate health or some such uh, claim like that, when the truth of the matter is, as, the, as confirmed and documented by numerous clinical studies, that it is safe and effective helping to reduce uh, the symptoms associated with BPH, but that's a claim that is a drug or therapeutic claim and cannot be made. Uh, that speaks to my previous testimony that I believe that it's time to open up uh, the range of, of, of available claims for these products because uh, as a consumer, I would like to be able to read on the label exactly what these products really can do if they can be documented by reasonable scientific evidence. I think it's a both-and qu question. Is it true that Germany get, requires a prescription if you're going to uh, buy vitamins? 
Uh, I'm not sure about vitamins, no. Uh, with herbs, they are sold uh, over the counter, what, what we would call over the counter, but in Germany it's called non prescription because they limit non prescription drugs to pharmacy only. Uh, they're not available. Herbal products uh, for general tonic and tea use are sold in supermarkets, health food stores, etc. But uh, the ones with the medicinal indications on them that have been approved by the commissioner are sold in pharmacy only. Uh, they represent one third of all non prescription drug sales, and half of those, uh, that one third, is selected by consumers. They can go in and buy those products without a prescription and they can also go in uh, after visiting their physician and buy it with a prescription and then get reimbursement on the health care plan. Uh, German physicians routinely prescribe herbal products and they represent half of the herbals sold in German pharmacies by prescription. Well, Mr. Rydell, what do consumers need to keep in mind as they look to choose vitamins between botanicals or the same as botanicals? Yes, the, the primary purpose that uh, consumers take uh, any dietary supplement. Primary is to maintain good health. Secondarily, to prevent ill health. And third is to treat illness. And the primary purpose, in other words, to maintain good health is the primary venue for nutrients, vitamins and minerals. Second venue is to prevent ill health, which is both herbs and vitamins and minerals, slightly higher dosage vitamins and minerals in some cases. And the third case to treat illnesses, self-treat, self-medicate, self-prescribe, both herbs as well as uh, vitamins, minerals, and other dietary ingredients. Dr. Benjamin? Well, I, uh, I'll tell you what I do. I, uh, I have for a number of years, and I'm happy now that the American Heart Association is supporting the use of soy. I take at least 25 to 40 milligrams of soy a day you know, whenever I possibly can. I travel a lot. When I can, I try to, be, to make certain that I have a certain amount of fish, deep water fish, but if I can't, then I, you know, on weeks, sometimes on end that I travel, I'll supplement my diet with fish oils. And I am uh, saddened that we haven't made some recommendations in that regard. And I think there are a number of cardiologists in academic institutions around the United States that would be concerned. Equally, I'd want to be sure that those fish oils are not contaminated with mercury and other potential impurities that can occur when you're getting fish that oftentimes are deep water fish and might be caught off the shores of industrialized countries. I also have a family history of diabetes. And although I'm not a diabetic, I like to take a multivitamin. There is some evidence, and I don't take uh, gigantic doses of vitamins, but I take, uh, uh, I take more than what I believe uh, I can get out of a good balanced diet, uh, and which includes chromium and coenzyme Q10, because there has been a reasonable amount of data suggesting at this point that it decreases insulin sensi that increases in insulin sensitivity, uh, which is key in non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, which has been seen in my family. So I think that I also like to take vitamin E, and in fact, I think there was a study done recently, although there have been numerous studies done about the benefits, and there have been arguments in academia about its benefits, uh, I think that there's reasonable data to suggest that vitamin E, when taken along with vitamin C in moderate doses as supplements, can significantly slow down or, or decrease the incidence of uh, mixed vascular dementias associated with aging. And at age 53, I now have to think about those things, and I've got two little kids, and I'd like to know that I can enjoy them over the next decade or so. So having said that, I think that using some things in moderation and being sure that you have appropriate information about them, so you know how to rationally utilize them, I think is laudable and appropriate, and I would hope to see this not only as something that's a freedom for patients, but I would hope that increasingly medical teaching institutions would be able to disseminate appropriate information to young healthcare professionals so that they can give this information to their family, to the patients and families that they treat. Let me ask you about how deep does the fish have to be that you want to eat for dinner? So, uh, and is this the let me tell you about the that. mercury zone? I uh, I think that. Um, I, I look uh, very carefully at the bottles that I purchase, and the concern that I have, which I mentioned in my written testimony and never got to, is my concern is to be certain, indeed, that what is on that label is, in fact, what is in that product. And I think all of us want to be assured of that kind of safety. Uh, so I knowingly take a risk. May I tell you that when I see my patients and I recommend things, and I do recommend fish oils, I, I give them written information about the potential dangers. I give them informed consent. I do that, by the way, even about giving somebody uh, acetaminophen. 
because there's increasing data now that giving, I'm a pediatrician, don't forget. When my kids get sick uh, and they get to 102 and a half or 103 fever, I get very nervous and so I give them Tylenol, sometimes, to, I shouldn't mention brand names, to treat myself. Nothing wrong with the product. But there was a study at the University of Maryland uh, over the last year or so that suggested that uh, the indiscriminate use of uh, acetaminophen, which I am guilty of uh, as a pediatrician and a dad, can uh, prolong the process of certain viral syndromes like the flu. I think that it's incumbent upon healthcare professionals to provide informed consent that gives information not only about uh, natural products, but we need to do that as well when we're, I don't know if informed consent is a fair word, provide rational balanced information so that people People can make intelligent choices for themselves, and that's when Mr. Silverglade um, uh, made a comment, uh, uh, which I, I, I understand where he, what he's addressing. I do think that consumers can make intelligent decisions. I have confidence in them, and I, I, and I believe that we have an obligation. It's incumbent upon us to be sure that we give them good information. I read what Dr. Wolf writes about and others, and I'm very impressed with it. I, the pharmacist letter has a thing called the natural database, which is absolutely outstanding, and I think it's incumbent upon healthcare professionals to do this. There's lots of internet information available. So my answer is, if you provide balanced information uh, and you're honest about it, people can make choices. My patients opt for things understanding that there are some potential downsides in prescription products just as well as in natural products. Uh, salmon and trout could be in the farms of salmon and trout. Yes. And uh, presumably that would be fresh water uh, is that uh, a, what you ought to look for if you're ordering It fish? depends on the content analysis of omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which I think would be the big issue. Dr. Wolf, what's your feeling on this? Uh, do well, consumers I, need to keep in mind as they look to choose between vitamins and botanicals? Well, I agree with several things Dr. Benjamin has said. First, I, I think people need to be able to make decisions, intelligent decisions, but in order to do that, they have to have information. And to the extent that anything we're talking about, or at least those, some of the things we're talking about, don't have adequate information on safety and efficacy or effectiveness, uh, they can't make intelligent decisions. Uh, it was of interest to hear that fish is consumed by my colleague, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, in, in one of the things that we attached to the testimony today, we said that in the August 7, 1999 issue of The Lancet, it was found that daily supplements of polysaturated fatty acids derived from fish, fish oil, demonstrate a beneficial effect on morbidity and mortality in patients with a recent heart attack, while daily use of 300 milligrams of synthetic vitamin E has no such beneficial effect. I mean, I think that one of the things that's becoming clear is that it isn't just the vitamin A or the vitamin E, whatever, they're food. So I think that one of the best answers to the question is neither botanicals nor vitamins, but foods, eating healthy foods. And we know what they are. We know more than we did before about what the content is. My mother, who will shortly, hopefully, be 93, uses calcium, a mineral supplement, and she takes one multiple vitamin a day. She sometimes thinks she doesn't need it because when she can get a hand, her hands on enough fruits and vegetables, it's okay. So I think that a dietary approach to maintaining good health, preventing ill health to the extent that can be done, is a good one. Uh, we don't have the overly and artificially concentrated amounts of some of the ingredients that occur in some of the herbals and some of the food supplements. So I think that whether one is talking about prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, botanicals, or vitamins, the choice should be based on adequate information of safety and effectiveness. And we just happen to have much more information about uh, over-the-counter drugs and prescription drugs. It's interesting that in the last few years, in a friendlier atmosphere, the FDA has been processing a much larger number of botanical products through the drug approval process. And to the extent that I'm sure some of those will get through, they will be able to make the claims that they treat this and treat this because there will be evidence for it, as opposed to the limitations that are made on the claims for dietary supplements because there's a lack of evidence. Well, uh, while uh, Chairman Burton re uh, comes back to preside, Mr. Silverglade, what's your answer to the question of what do consumers need to keep in mind should they uh, look to the vitamins and the botanicals? 
What well, do you think? When I uh, speak to individual consumers, I try to explain it this way. Vitamins and minerals are in one category, and herbals are in another category. Uh, vitamins and minerals provide nutritional value. Herbals do not. They may be pharmacologically active. And regarding all the safety uh, controversies that have existed in the dietary supplement area, whether, whatever one takes, uh, agrees with those reports of adverse reactions or disagrees with them, I would note for the record that they almost all involve, uh, none of them involve vitamins and minerals. They almost all involve herbal uh, products or other types of dietary supplements beyond vitamins and minerals. Let me just uh, ask one question, then I'll yield to my colleague from uh, Washington. Uh, the fish that you were talking about that uh, have mercury in them, to ingest those is, is not good. It's, 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 uh, it creates a, a danger for people, doesn't it? Chronic mercury intoxication has a direct effect on the central nervous system. Okay, to, let me to let mention me, just one of a number of other let, let me adverse ask you, effects. So mercury given to anybody, children or adults, uh, to take internally is, is, is a Absolutely danger. impardonable. A absolutely impardonable. I hope everybody heard that, because do you know that the, the, the vaccinations that we give children yeah. contain thimerosal, which yes, contains, contains mercury, and there's a great uh, growing body of evidence that it may contribute to uh, autism in kids, and it may contribute to be a contributing factor in Alzheimer's, and yet we have products on the market that are given on a regular basis in, in injection form vaccinations in injection form that are putting mercury into our kids. My grandson got 40, how many, 47 times? 47 times the amount of mercury that's supposedly tolerable in an adult in one day, and he's autistic. But and the FDA is in the process of phasing that out. You're absolutely right, and well, there was really no excuse for it being put in the first place. There are other non-mercury sure, sure. preservatives but that could FDA's have been used. But the FDA has been saying they're going to phase it out for years Co and years and years, Congressman, and they have enough vaccinations today. You just haven't done enough oversight over them. That's well, the you, problem. You, well, <laughs> you, may, you, you may rest assured I was not really one of those people that was aware of how autism affects families across this country until it happened to my own. But we are aware now, and you may rest assured we're going to. But the point is, you, you as leaders in the health food industry and as doctors need to stress very strongly that uh, these toxic substances should not be, give, be, be being given to adults or children in this country in any form. So, yes, sir. Yeah, if I may, on fish oils, okay, which are the fish body oils that we're talking about here, most of the mercury resides in the flesh of the fish, uh -huh. which is not a dietary supplement. That's the food. Yes, sir. Okay, but the fish body oil, and every C of A for fish body oil indicates in microgram dosages the levels of mercury, and you can reject that C of A if it exceeds your specifications. And there, are, quite frankly, are no government specifications, which is another thing they can go after. Yes, yes. sir. I, I um, you know, I... I'm, I'm, I'm involved in this industry, but I also, am a, as I mentioned, a physician. I, I really think we need help with standards, and I really look to the FDA to help us in this regard. I don't always trust those C of A's, and I have seen, you know, we, we don't make herbal products. We make minerals and vitamins, and even though, as you mentioned, Mr. Silverglade, there are a few, you know, no reports of to toxic reactions, I take this responsibility very seriously, and I can tell you that just yesterday, a product that we were about to finish uh, did not have an adequate amount of iodine, and we had to, fortunately, we were able to catch it and redo it simply because the CFA was not appropriate. I'm not, I, I think that we need appropriate guidelines, and there's one other thing that I would like to tell you about that. If you go to three or four, we use independent laboratories to test our product. I could send them to three or four labs, and I'm going to get three or four different responses on the same product that indeed we have. There need to be standards of validating tested methodologies. I would think that that's true in herbal products. It's certainly true in vitamins and minerals. And I, I, it's a great concern. I don't see that as a control. I see that as an asset. I know the USP has been involved in trying to set some of these standards in minerals and vitamins. And I can tell you that I, for one, would welcome it because it would help help us separate the wheat from the chaff. It's very hard to determine with the best of intentions if what you're making is meeting the standards that you want to have. Yes, sir. Gentlelady from Washington. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, <clears throat> I appreciate this hearing. I think it is uh, immensely uh, important hearing. Um, 
I am impressed with the uh, a huge market, and I, uh, if, if I might say so, lucrative market that has uh, developed uh, in dietary supplements, and I, I should also say count me in, because uh, I am impressed with the scientific evidence that is beginning to be developed on the effectiveness of at least some of these uh, supplements, uh, beginning to be developed because, of course, there isn't a lot of incentive to use traditional scientific methodology here at all. And when you consider that the market is expansive beyond all measure, uh, it, we, we are bordering on irresponsibility to allow it to grow the way it did when it was insignificant in, in, in our society. I think there are important new substances, I am convinced, new supplements that have an important effect one way or the other upon health. But this industry is in danger of giving dietary supplements a bad name. Uh, when people read that untested supplements have had adverse effects, what are they to think? They ought to think that they are unprotected. I am concerned at two levels. At the level of danger, I thought I lived in a society that at least protected us from danger. Uh, Anna Fedrin may, may uh, uh, bring out some of those concerns. And secondly, I am concerned at the level of unwanted scientific claims. Uh, surely we're not, we're, we are raising uh, children, we are a well-educated society, to believe in the scientific method. You, you know, you show me A uh, causality to B. And yet these same well-educated people uh, go into the market and buy what looks like it works. Well, nobody would, would think of taking pharmaceuticals that look like they work. You want a doctor to tell me they work? They want somebody to, to indicate that there have been some, some kinds of trials to indicate that they do work. Um, when we took um, dietary supplements effectively out of, of the FDA regulatory scheme, it seems to me we had an obligation to put something in its place. I can understand the concern with regulation when you consider the proliferation of substances we're talking about. But, I mean, have we considered that, for example, how many of the elderly uh, must surely be encouraged to take these supplements at this time? Not to mention very young people, if not children. Or when we hear about interactions with known substances, ask your pharmacist because you need to know whether or not something you're taking will interact with something that seems perfectly benign. And yet these substances um, proliferate. <laughs> I, am, I, I wonder, as I think about what's happened to uh, all kinds of things in the stock market, I bet these haven't been affected in the stock market. These things are, you know, have a life of their own. People don't just go out and get them. They're elixirs, they're magic. Whatever happened to the way we've been trained uh, to understand whether or not you should take something in your body or you should take whatever is written on a label. And you can write anything on a label in, in, these, in, in these things. I am concerned because I think some of these uh, di dietary supplements hold great promise. If traditional regulation is not the, the uh, answer, then there must be an answer better than recklessness. And that's where we're getting to, as we encourage old people looking for longer life, children who read these labels and think this is harmless, I can take it and get what it says I will get, young people still in the formation of their brains and in, in the formation of their bodies. This is not the way we do business in a, in a, in a, in a society that prides itself on being on an intelligent approach to uh, human health. Uh, and, and I think a, a hearing like this ought to encourage us to think deeply about tailoring to these dietary supplements uh, what it would take to make them safe and to make them truthful. 
I think it is shameful to be an advanced society which allows to proliferate substances which are either making obviously false claims or claims that have not been proved or may even go so far as to be danger, dangerous. I would expect that in traditional societies where you have witch doctors or others who claim things that they cannot prove. That is not supposed to be the country in which I live. And I think we need to, to do more than talk about these claims. We need to do something that is very difficult, to think of a way to get at this without obliterating the very good work that these substances uh, clearly have shown they could do uh, for uh, human health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlelady. I, I have uh, two more questions for this panel, and then we'll conclude and go to the people from the FDA. Uh, Dr. Benjamin, uh, do you think we need to redo the recommended daily allowance guidelines? I, um, no, I, I, I'm not against the RDA because I think the minimum standards, but I don't think that they necessarily encourage optimal health. I think they're two separate issues. Okay. Anybody else have any comment on that? If not, uh, Mr. Isaacson or Israelson, uh, please explain what happened to uh, uh, Shaman uh, Botanics last year? Shaman Pharmaceuticals? Yes. I, I presume it was pharmaceuticals. What would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> Just one second. Well, uh, can you explain the process that they went through with the Food and Drug Administration last year? Oh, yes. Okay. It's actually a longer story than that. I'll try and be brief. Uh, this is a company that is, was in existence in about uh, 15 years. And the concept was to do ethnobotanical prospecting, principally in the equatorial belts around the world, to identify new substances that could be developed into new drug products. It was a very high-tech, high-expense process. They had developed uh, two or three very promising products, one for diabetes, one for severe diarrhea, and several others. Uh, they had uh, an NDA before um, FDA, and they were phase three, and were quite sure that they were going to be approved. Um, apparently, the, um, they were put on clinical hold, and it essentially bankrupted the company. They simply couldn't advance the project beyond that. Uh, they determined that because they had a number of botanical products in their portfolio that they had collected for a number of years, hundreds and hundreds of very interesting plants, uh, a number of which were uh, dietary ingredients, that they selectively chose a couple of products that could be marketed as dietary supplements, trying to salvage a very large investment. And um, I think the unfortunate news is that they simply couldn't hang on. And so as of today, uh, they are in the process of... Uh, selling off the assets of the company, and it will fairly soon uh, be out of business. Well, I want to thank you all very, very much. Uh, we really appreciate your being here and your patience, and uh, we're going to continue to ride herd on this issue. And if you have anything further that you'd like to give to the committee, if you could submit that to me in writing, we sure appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. You, The next panel is uh, Mr. Joseph Levitt, Director of uh, the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and Elizabeth Yetley, uh, Ph.D., U.S. Delegate to Codex Alimentarius Commission on Nutrition and Foods for Special Dietary Uses. Oh, you need to put that in bigger print. You know why that needs to be in bigger print? That's right. <coughs> Uh, did I ever tell you that before? Oh, okay. I just wondered. I know, but always put everything in bigger print. Thank you very much.
Would you both uh, please rise? Just stand up. Yeah. I just see you stand. I just stood. You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, stuff, God. Yes, I do. You see. Okay, Mr. Levitt, did you have an opening statement, or Dr. Yetley? Can you turn your mic on and pull this a little closer to you? Push. There you go. That does, does that it. work? That does Is that it. better? That does it. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, it's a pleasure for you to be here today, as you noted in your opening statement, as a return visit um, to give you an update on how we're progressing on dietary supplements. Um, as you recall, when we testified here nearly two years ago, there was a recognition that while FDA had made taken a number of steps, the progress we viewed as too slow. And even more important, it was a view that we did not have, if you will, an overall plan or strategy or a blueprint for how we should implement this law. And we took those concerns to heart. We sat on and we developed that very year, the uh, FDA Dietary Supplement Strategic Plan. It has four program objectives. Number one, that we should fully implement the SHEA. In doing that, we would seek to provide a high level of consumer confidence in the safety, composition, and labeling of these products. We would do that through a science-based regulatory approach, the same kind of approach that had made our other programs successful. And four, regretfully, it would take some time. It would take time to do this. We recognize it was a long-term project, not a quick fix. In developing the plan, we had substantial public input. I chaired public meetings in both here in Washington and in California. And through that, we developed six overall elements for our strategic plan. Number one is safety. Everybody we talked to correctly said safety first. That covers our adverse event reporting, which you're, which you're familiar with, our GMPs, and product by product actions as may be needed. Second is labeling. As you know, a lot of interest in claims, structure function claims, health claims, substantiation for claims, and so forth. Third are the boundary issues. What is the coverage of the SHEA, but what intrudes into the drug rules, the, the conventional food rules, or even the cosmetic rules? So we need to set the boundaries and make sure they are clear. Four is enforcement. As you heard today, um, there are calls from all quarters that there needs to be stronger FDA enforcement, both to be sure that the law is being enforced and that there is a level playing field so that those who do try to follow the rules are not unduly hampered by those that do not. Uh, finally, what, third, fifth, what I feel is the most important part of the strategic plan is the need for a strong underpinning of a strong scientific base. Again, as we heard today, public confidence and credibility will come primarily from a knowledge that there are scientific studies and scientific knowledge undergirding these products, their safety, their uses, and so forth, and, and that is very, very important. And finally, as we added to our plan following the public meetings, there needs to be a commitment to an ongoing dialogue with the entire dietary supplement community, the industry, consumers, health professionals, and that needs to be a two-way dialogue so that we continue having that. We have started through our advisory committee process, a standing advisory committee, so we have a forum that we can regularly bring these issues to and that we should have our first meeting of that later this year. In terms of a progress report, recognizing that this was a long-term plan, each year, we have developed at the beginning of the year what I call our yellow book or our goals for that year. What can we do within our established resource levels? We, at the beginning of the year, we say this is what we can do. At the end of the year, through our blue book or our report card, we report out what we did accomplish. And we've been very successful in, in accomplishing the incremental progress that we felt we could do year by year. Finally, Congress recognized, as virtually every speaker we were gratified did here today, that there are significant funding issues. And, and uh, our Appropriations Committee asked us this past fall, okay, you've got your strategic plan, now tell us what it would take to implement that plan. Uh, that, plan that report is due to Congress this spring, and we are actively working on it and hope that we'll be submitting to that. When we do th submit that, you will see fairly quickly why it is so important. Um, the current funding levels on this chart show that the current funding for dietary supplements is about $6 million uh, for a Food and Drug Administration that has an over $1 billion budget. 
That is compared to even a small program like the Food Additive Pre-Market Review, which has more than four times that amount at $28 million. Um, and you see on the right very large programs, a new drug review program, the Food Safety Initiative program. While nobody would say that the dietary supplement needs are of the order of magnitude that you have on the right, nevertheless, you see by comparison, this is virtually our smallest program, um, something that, that we clearly do need to get more into the middle set of funding needs. We have thought about if we got funding, how we would implement that. And as we've done with other programs, um, you need to implement things in phases. Uh, we have felt that the, the three primary areas are number one, dealing with the safety and the regulatory framework primarily first, followed by the field needs, and finally buttressing the science needs. So if we got funding in three stages, you see that in the first year on the left, we would put more than half of it in the first year to the safety and the regulatory needs with some starting in the field and some starting on the science base. In the second year, anticipating that the good manufacturing practice regulations would be out, um, it is time to start inspecting against those regulations. So in the middle year, the primary addition would be into the field area. And finally, when we get to full fruition, we would be adding to the science space, which is the, the bottom part there, and would allow us both intramural but also extramurally. One thing we were able to do starting this year is we did get one million dollars as a starting point to work with the University of Mississippi, which is a very capable botanical center. And we're looking forward to that as a starting point, but also as a point for future growth. So we feel that we do now have a plan. We feel that through the development of this plan, we do have a way to fully implement the SHEA to provide what I think what everybody wants is a high level of confidence in the safety, composition, labeling of the products. We know that the progress to date has been, I'll say generously, incremental. Uh, but when you look at the comparative funding chart, that is what we're dealing with. Nearly all of our funding now, more and more, is becoming clearly earmarked. Food safety money goes for food safety. Food additive money goes for food additive. No money is earmarked for dietary supplements except for the $1 million that I mentioned. Uh, we're hoping that in coming sessions the Congress will be able to deal with that and that we will be able to provide the kind of information that the Congress needs. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, while not specific to dietary supplements, as our program looks broadly into the future, we have committed ourselves within the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition to establishing what we consider to be a truly world-class organization. That starts with, number one, having a science-based decision-making capacity for public health-based decisions. Number two, they have the capacity to implement those decisions in a timely way, clearly something everybody supports. And third is to have a culture that is based both on accountability Ability, like reporting out what you've done, but also a culture involving cooperation and respect for our stakeholders, for the public that we serve. We feel that taking these together will provide a very strengthened organization and will create what we consider what we call a new day in the center. With that introduction, we're pleased to answer questions. Uh, I will introduce Dr. Beth Yetley. She is the lead scientist for nutrition in our center. She is also, as you mentioned, the U.S. delegate to the Codex Committee that is of interest to this committee. Um, I would apologize to the chairman that my written testimony did not address the Codex issue. I apologize for that. We felt by having Dr. Yetley here between her and I, we would be happy to answer any questions you have. Clearly, it is an issue of interest, and we'll be be happy to submit any additional information to the record that may be needed to fill out that issue. Good, thank you. Uh, how long will it take to, uh, to implement this program? We have set out that for when we began, and we, we issued this about a year ago, that we could get this fully implemented in 10 years. Now, last year was one year, this year is two years. Um, uh, before we got funding, it would probably be ye three, year three or year four to begin a three-year funding. And, and so that's why we think it would take up to 10 years to do it. And that's uh, the, is that the outside or the inside? Um, it depends if the funding comes in the third or fourth year or in the seventh or eighth year. 
So you're saying that we need to get busy and get you the money? That is correct. As we've said well, here, well, the why, plan is it, why is it that doesn't surprise me? <laughs> we, we, we said when we distributed the plan that the plan could be accelerated or unfortunately even decelerated, uh -huh. depending on what funding and, and, and resources are available to address that. Like any other program, our successful programs are those, not surprisingly, that have got people dedicated to work on that project day in and day out. Okay. I have a few questions for you. Thank uh, you. And, uh, and Dr. Yetley. Uh, is there any difference between reports you receive from manufacturers and medical professionals and those received directly from, from consumers, such as the adverse events reports the FDA has said are associated with ephedra, uh, such, the, such as the quantity and, more importantly, the quality of information in the report? Um, the, uh, our adverse event system, um, as your question implies, does welcome reports from any source. We receive actually relatively few from manufacturers themselves. We receive most of our reports from health professionals or consumers. Um, where a health prof generally, where a health professional submits the report, it is more focused than if a consumer submits a report. And very often when a consumer submits a report, while it's very lengthy, here's all my medical records, all I really know is I got sick, it might have had to do with this product, here, see if you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. and, and so consumer reports, while we welcome them, often do, do require a lot of investigatory work, follow-up work, if you will, detective work from the FDA. If a health professional has screened it, if a company has screened it, um, and try to do some of that leg work to try to figure out what is going on here. Some can easily be dropped out, others focus, get this information, we would know better whether this is something that is related to the product or not. The reason I ask that question is uh, you've heard me refer earlier today to the uh, study that was done at Harvard and Columbia University, which is not yet in the public domain, right. but there has been a synopsis that came out. And I don't know if you, do you have a copy of that? Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, but that, uh, it, it, it shows that if, if these products are taken and they're labeled properly and they're taken in a proper manner, that uh, they're safe. And I hope that you'll take a look at the entire report as well as the uh, synopsis of it. Well, we will, if I may, Mr. Chairman, we are, shall I say, looking very forward to reviewing the full results of that study. As you know, we have been trying to get solicit from the investigators the full report of that study for some many months. Yes. And yes. it is an important study. We agree with that. That you can do to help us get yeah. access to that underlying report, we think would be very important for everybody involved to have access well, to that. We, we are we're pushing to get that published completely Thank and you. to you as quickly as possible. And the reason is that, and I think you alluded to this, that in a random sample of the uh, adverse events reports, 92 out of 864 reports, we found that 39% lacked information on the amount of the product consumed. They could have taken three times as much as they should or shouldn't. 41% uh, lacked information on the frequency with which the product was consumed. 28% lacked information on the duration for which the product was consumed. And a total of 45% of the adverse events reports lacked information on either dose, frequency, or dur duration. And 24% lacked information on all three dimensions. Finally, 62% of the adverse events reports in our sample did not contain medical records, which are important in determining potential, potential underlying conditions that might have caused the adverse event. You know, they may have had something wrong with them initially and they shouldn't have been taking it in the first place. Rather than assuming ingestion of dietary supplements containing ephedrine, alkaloids caused the event. Uh, so I, and, and one of the things that was, the reason I focus on this so much is that just before the last administration left, there was strong indications that there was going to be an ephedra, rec, uh, uh, an ephedra regulation uh, passed by the uh, FDA before this report had been fully reviewed, and, and I'm happy to say that they deferred action on that until they, until they read the, the report and, and do further study on that. In, uh, in 1999, in both a January letter and at a May hearing, I discussed with the FDA a number of areas in which the agency was what I considered deficient in relation to its duties under DSHEA. For example, we discussed the poor quality of the adverse events uh, reporting database, the deficiencies with the MedWatch program system, and other such items. 
Those problems included the fact that the adverse event reports contained information that was largely anecdotal and the fact that the MedWatch system was overburdened. Have you fixed the problems that were identified in 1999? Well, one of the problems we have fixed, you will recall that one of the concerns and legitimate concerns was that it was taking companies a very long time to get access uh, through the Freedom of Information Act to um, the reports that affected their own products. And we did devote uh, funding that we had available to a contractor to take care of that problem. And I believe, as one of the prior witnesses said, they were glad to see that that, that backlog has been essentially eliminated and that we're able to keep up now. So that's, that's one problem that was solved. Second, we have started to design what really ought to be a modernized 21st century state-of-the-art system. This is not gold-plated. This is standard stuff. Unfortunately, um, as I believe you're also familiar, um, for two consecutive years, the president requested two and a half million dollars in the budget to fund that system, um, and that was not received in either of those two years. And so we're still, if you will, at the design phase. Uh, we very much want to move and modernize our system, um, and we have put together, as I said, design phase steps but we're still short of where we want to be on adverse event reporting, and we're hopeful that one of these years, the funding will come through for what we've been requested. You know, I, I heard what you said a while ago. It was not lost on me that you said a lot of the money is earmarked for specific functions, and therefore it can't be used for something else. Now, how much money does the FDA get annually? The FDA budget is over a billion dollars, maybe 1.2, 1.3 in that area. The and, Congress and, and, then breaks it down by FDA function, foods, drugs, whatever. Uh, within the food part, there is the headquarters in the field. Um, and so the, the food budget for my center is about $125 million. With the field, it's uh, uh, together close to $300 million. Uh, most of that is earmarked for food safety. Most of the rest is, is tied up in salaries of people with particular knowledge and expertise that have jobs to do. Well, um, the, the reason I ask these questions in, in, in more detail is that you don't have any latitude with any of this money so that you could move in, in a different area to, where, that you felt uh, uh, needed more uh, uh, more current attention or more rapid attention? We, we have incredibly little latitude. In fact, in recent years, the budget has become increasingly earmarked. As an example, I'll tell you, even within food safety, we have six, six separate categories of food safety, whether it is for surveillance, whether it's for compliance and inspections, research, education, and so forth. And so our monies are increasingly restricted and not increasingly flexible. And there are very strict rules about to what extent the agency is able to move money between programs um, in reasonably small amounts of money. So, so what you're saying is the Congress is, is putting fences around your money so that you can only use it for one desired, for one, one purpose. And the only way we can get more money into these areas that we're talking about today is is uh, is to appropriate more money. That is correct. Would you would you prefer if there was less uh, earmarking so that you could be a little more flexible, or do you like their earmarking? I, I think almost any administrator would prefer more flexibility. Almost any appropriator would prefer earmarking. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I, I work with those guys. <laughs> in our but, May, excuse me, Mr. Chair, well, what we have tried to do, what we have tried to do, and I don't, uh, don't want to overemphasize it, but through the development of the, of the strategic plan, not only the contents of it, but the manner, the spirit, the mode in which we developed it, we have tried to really say very clearly, we want to implement this law. We want to do it to the very best of our ability. We don't like coming up here and testifying how we can do one regulation every two years and why things take so long and why we can't do this. Okay. We have an energetic group of people who, frankly, would like to move ahead. In May 1999, the FDA committed that there were problems with the adverse right. reporting system for dietary supplements. FDA 
uh, agreed that a hearing to fix a number uh, agreed in that hearing to fix that uh, number of serious problems and I guess you pretty much answered this uh, you, 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 you moved in that direction but not very rapidly because of the resources and you're saying it's going to take what 10 years well no I mean if uh, let me I want to do two things if I may one speak to the 10 years sometimes there is the belief but I would like to rectify that that what it means is nothing good will happen for 10 years that's not what we're saying we will continue to make improvements every year the pace at which before we're at the level everybody would like to be at we believe will be will be in 10 years but we think we're already better than we were two years ago and we will keep getting better that's point number one point number two on the adverse event reporting system thinking back to the hearing a couple of years ago one of the points you raised was um, does when FDE reviews these reports to what extent do we do it I'm gonna call it a triage of, of is this likely to be related is this unlikely to be related in this particular report because they're, they're going to be different and when we did review the reports related to ephedra we did go through very carefully and try to do those triage and many of the reports we we ourselves concluded did not have enough information to reach a conclusion there was some we thought were likely to be related some we thought were possibly related some we thought were probably not related at all we and, and but we believe the process of going through that i would say is itself an improvement in the system and we subjected our view to peer review in several ways we asked not only ourselves our own group to do it we asked a separate group at our drug center to review those we asked a number of independent experts to go out and review those and while people did not review re, uh, uh, judge every report exactly the same way there is considerable amount of consistency in those different reviews of those reports and so we feel that the if you will the expertise and the consistency and the transparency of how we're looking at these kinds of reports is also being improved and I think transparency is another element that I think is very important so that the Congress the public the industry knows how we're functioning and can have confidence in it has the FDA made any effort to meet with uh, industry trade associations to discuss how to resolve the outstanding issues with respect to the ephedra products okay. uh, ephedra again I think as almost every speaker said earlier has been well it's probably been our single most difficult issue that we've had to deal with H have you met with any industry um, officials what we what we have done is we had a public meeting um, in which everybody was invited it was actually chaired by the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Women's Health and I believe virtually all of the industry groups um, that uh, were interested in participating certainly had an opportunity and most did come and present data we have not tried to have separate meetings uh, we have felt that this is an important issue that everything be done out in public out in the open so that nobody is viewed as we're meeting with this group instead of that group there are a lot of groups as as you know and that's been our way of trying to be even-handed mm. uh, well ac according to what we have here other than a meeting with uh, CRN concerning the Cantox report uh, we're aware of no such efforts since the issuance of FDA's June 1997 proposal the CRN meeting was similar to two other meetings FDA had had with industry trade associations in December 1997 and May of 1999 where the FDA listened but refused to discuss the issues claiming the existence of the proposed rule prevented any such discussion so are these listening sessions where you just listen and then uh, you, you, you don't have any dialogue between the well the the, the, re the reason that we met with the uh, Council of Responsible Nutrition on the Cantox study was because that was an avenue where they said we are collecting a new scientific analysis and they wanted to come in and say do you agree with this kind of analysis we did give them some comments on it um, and when they had that analysis nearly completed they asked to come in and present to us what it said um, they're also now that I'm thinking back um, I wasn't anticipating that particular question um, I do recall a meeting that I held 
Um, I remember Mr. Israelson was there with a group of uh, ephedra manufacturers and trade associations, who by now, it was probably a couple years ago, it was some time, that did result in them submitting that uh, industry guidance document that was referred to um, a, a little bit. I think our concerns there was we have, what we tried to do is we tried to separate out first what is the nature of the risk before we jump to the remedy. And so the meetings I tried to have tried to focus on what are the data that you have. We want, we tried, you can't believe how much we tried to meet with the investigators doing that important study so that we can try and get a better sense of what the data are. Okay. And without people coming in with new data, I mean, everybody wants to meet, but in fairness, nobody wants to bring in new data. Well, let, let me just say, and, and I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, okay. uh, Representative La Tourette. It, 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 it seems to me that there needs to be a, a, a dialogue because they're on one side on this issue and you apparently are on the other side. Uh, hopefully, the Harvard and uh, Columbia studies uh, will serve as a catalyst for that kind of discussion because that should be new information. I mean, that was a six-month safety and eff efficacy trial, and uh, that should help. But, it, it, you know, I've, I've always been a believer, and I think my colleagues on the Democrat side will attest to the fact that we usually get along a little bit better when we talk instead of just start throwing bombs at each other. You know what I mean? Right. I absolutely and, agree. Well, but when you had these meetings, according to the information we have, it was more of a listening session for you without any dialogue back and forth. I mean, if they say something about a claim they're making, it seems to me that you and other scientists at the FDA should say, well, give us, give us the information. What is, it, what is it that we're missing here that we don't see so that they can, there can be a dialogue? Sometimes the cold, hard facts that they give you on a piece of paper or something they say in a meeting isn't, uh, isn't uh, sufficient to, uh, to answer all the questions that you may have and unless you let them know that. You know, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know. Right, I, I, I certainly, Mr. Chairman, I take that as a fair suggestion. Okay. Appreciate that. All right. I'll turn this over to Mr. LaTourette because my back is bothering me. I've got ice on it. And if I don't get up and walk around a little bit, I'm going to be frozen to this seat for the rest of my life. <laughs> Mr. LaTourette. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to uh, uh, apologize for being late. We had a little plane difficulty getting from Cleveland. But this is a hearing that I very much want to do. Uh, to be in attendance at, and I appreciate your your willingness to be here, and we'll let the chairman sort of recuperate and, and walk around and get some substance. Uh, Mr. Levitt, uh, I, I think the chairman might have been talking to you, and if I repeat something because I wasn't in the room, I apologize, and you Quite don't right. me, and I, I take guidance better than most uh, on my side of the aisle, but uh, as a result of the, uh, the 1999 uh, GAO study, or audit, uh, that at least in the minds of some of us established that the FDA had no scientific basis for the serving and duration uh, limits contained in the 1997 proposed rule. Uh, it's my understanding that the FDA withdrew most of this proposal, leaving all, only other proposed actions in place. Uh, my question is, does the FDA maintain that the remaining portions of that proposed rule uh, prevent the agency from having an open dialogue with the industry on ephedra? No. Okay. Then, then why didn't the FDA withdraw the entire uh, rule? Well, the, we, we would, let me go back. As your question states, um, the FDA issued a proposed rule by now close to four years ago. It had a number of provisions. The cornerstone, if you will, of that regulation was a proposed limit on the uh, dose, on how much ephedra could be in each tablet. Um, the agency believed that it did have a credible basis for proposing that. Um, through the public comment period and through review by GAO, that was called into question. And while the GAO certainly agreed with us that there is a underlying public health issue here, they did not believe that the data we presented to support that dosing level um, was sustainable. As a result of that and other public comments, we withdrew the dosing portion of the final rule. We withdrew other related parts of the final rule in terms such as uh, how many days duration the product could be used for, things that were, that were intertwined with that requirement. What that basically left with 
was some general warnings that had been proposed and a question on whether or not there ought to be a combination allowed with caffeine or whether it ought to be sold only as a single ingredient and not in combination with caffeine. We um, solicited further comment um, on those and other issues and in, in part because we're waiting for the results from that study, um, those are all still open questions. Uh, the, uh, the response to my longer question was a simple no, and I, I think this might have been when I walked in uh, and you and the chairman were having a conversation, I, right. the, the end of my question is that it's your belief that it doesn't prevent that dialogue from occurring. It does not prevent that dialogue, correct. Uh, Inevitably what happens um, is when we have that dialogue, we tend to ask where, what scientific studies do you have to support what you're proposing? Right. And they ask us what evidence we have to prevent what they are proposing and we reach an impasse. And, and that, is that a, a, an accurate description, in fact, of what has occurred? I mean, there, there have been dialogues, but you yes. have this Mexican standoff because nobody is able to convince the other side with evidence that the, they would choose to have. So. Well, I, again, that, that is why we went to a, the format of a public meeting chaired by someone other than the FDA. Um, and I think those that attended that meeting did feel that the spirit was genuine that it was a, a, a clear desire um, to get at whatever information was available out there. Um, there were relatively few um, well-controlled studies out there to report in, uh, which is part of the dilemma we're all in. We have a, a very large number of adverse reports, adverse event reports, People have different interpretations of what they mean. Whatever they mean, they're a signal of something. And in order to try and get at additional data that would help clarify what that signal is or confirm and so forth is where we are trying to get. We're also um, working with the National Institutes of Health, the Office of Dietary Supplements, the uh, Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine on what research they might be able to fund that could help provide answers to these questions. I think everybody wants to know what the answers are because everybody wants to provide consumers with the best information available. Okay. Are, are you familiar with the, uh, the FOIA request? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Are, are you familiar with the FOIA request filed, I think, four or five months ago by certain industry groups of the FDA? Uh, concerning this issue, the Freedom of Information we, we have a long series of, of requests from different members of the industry. Um, as I mentioned before, the general issue of adverse event reports um, that uh, uh, we were actually up to two years behind schedule has been rectified. Uh, and as of, uh, as of the beginning of this fiscal year, uh, we were up to date. Uh, I'm told that since then, I think sometime over the winter, though your date may be better than mine if you have an actual date than my memory, there has been a relatively recent request of a very large volume of documents and we're busy processing that now. Okay, Did you, are you able to give us any, any uh, thought or idea of, of when that might occur? Um, well, uh, I, I don't have a date. If you like, I can try and submit one for the record. If you could, I'd, I'd appreciate that. that so. Other information that we had was that, in fact, that since December of, not last December, but December a year ago, 1999, uh, adverse event reports had not been released. Are you saying that that, that has been rectified? Well, request well for those information? what has been requested is, is the, the, the FOR requests that had been longstanding have all been filled. And those that were submitted last year have been filled, and we have a process now for responding to FOI requests for, um, uh, for these kinds of reports. There is a step further, and it may be your next question, and we have it listed in our goals for this year, to try and establish a process that's more when reports come in, manufacturers can get real-time access to those. Uh, we are actively involved in reviewing how to do that. There are some legal restrictions we are running into in terms of when people submit their medical records. There are Privacy Act issues that run into disclosability 
right. um, and, and so we are trying to sort through those conflicting obligations on us. One is to release, and one is to be sure you don't release. Right. And when they are intertwined in the same document set, uh, we want to be sure we do that right and don't do it injustice either way. But our goal is to have a, a system that is responsive on more or less a real-time basis for manufacturers. Okay, well, and, and maybe I've, I've confused myself, but I, I, get, I sort of two, two separate issues. One is the, the FOIA request, the Freedom of Information request. The, the other information that I think the, the committee had was that there had been no release uh, to the public at all uh, of any AER since December of 1999. Is that what you're in the process of uh, coming up with a better system? What we're coming up with is a better system of getting reports directly to the manufacturers when manufacturers are identified once they come into us. In other words, not waiting for them to, to figure out there's a report and submit an FOI. Right. Presume that companies have a standing FOI request right. for reports that are about their products. It, is it based upon your knowledge and accurate observation, though, that, that the agency has not made public any adverse event reports on Ephedra since a year ago, December? Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that, that's probably accurate, yeah. And, and, and the reason for that is? Sa same reason. Um, that what we have done is we have responded to the, F we, we have simply responded to the FOI request and devoted our energy there. Um, we, we released last year, and let's just be sure we have the dates correct, because I do lose track of time, it was actually March of 2000, now we're in 2001. It was in March of 2000 that we released all of the reports, yes? And those were all the reports more or less up to that time. I'm sure there was a cutoff point, it wasn't the day before. Right. And so it might have been December 99, that probably sounds about right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yetley, uh, the committee. Excuse me if I may, maybe I, I, I should quit while I'm ahead. No, you're, doing, um, you're doing great. The more information, the better. Uh, I'm sorry, then I lost my train of thought. I'll have to let you get back to Dr. Yetley, and I'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Well, Mr. Levitt, we'll come back to you, Dr. Yetley. Thank Yetley. you. Dr. Yetley, just a couple of questions for you. We, we have received some, some observations um, that Perhaps it, the United States isn't being represented by you, um, according to uh, the uh, DSHEA uh, in the Codex meetings. Um, and I'd, I'd invite you to, to respond to that observation that the committees received. Um, the representation uh, that we have at the U.S. Codex meetings includes a delegation that is, consists of approximately 25 people with a very broad range of interests, and we certainly work with that group throughout the meeting. I think it is important to note, if you check the, uh, our written comments that were submitted to the committee, to the commi uh, Codex committee prior to the meeting, as well as their record of the comments made at the meeting, that the U.S. delegate uh, indicated very clearly that we support consumer choice and access to dietary supplements that are safe and are labeled in a truthful and non-misleading manner, wanting very much to underscore the current uh, philosophy and approach that we're using within the U.S. Okay. Hey, can you explain to the, the, the committee, and I guess the, the committee is just me at the moment, but can you explain <laughs> to the committee uh, the, the uh, National Academy of Sciences documents that you shared at the Codex meeting uh, and its relevance. I didn't hear the last part of the uh, question. And, and its relevance. Um, at the time we shared the, that document, which was in 1998, the committee was leaning very strongly towards setting maximum upper limits in these guidelines that were based on arbitrary standards of approximately 150% of the RDA. That clearly is not consistent with how we uh, approach this issue in the U.S., and it is also not consistent with a sound science-based approach to codex matters. So we therefore countered that particular proposal by suggesting they might consider it a sound science-based risk assessment approach that had been developed by our National Academy of Sciences and we therefore submitted that document for their consider consideration. 
and, and the document was a description of the document was a description of the conceptual model system that our National Academy of Sciences is currently using to set um, upper limits that are based on a risk assessment approach for nutrients. Okay. What is the, uh, the current standing uh, of the U.S. Uh, DSHEA position within CODEX today? Well, the CODEX itself deals with international trade. The um, Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act and other uh, relevant uh, uh, provisions of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, as well as FDA regulations, still will govern and will continue to govern regardless of what CODEX does how dietary supplements are marketed within the U.S. What the Codex standards do, and I think Mr. Riedel from the previous panel explained this, by not having Codex standards for vitamin and mineral supplements, the U.S. industry is finding that they are encountering trade barriers to exporting their products to other countries. So the Codex standards simply will affect the ability of our manufacturers to export products, but will not in any way affect uh, how products are uh, made available and uh, distributed within the United States. Does the agency uh, have information uh, as to how the other member, uh, the other 164 countries in, in the Codex regulate uh, minerals, botanicals, and, and things of that nature? Uh, we don't have specific information about uh, the different countries. They're clearly, based on the discussions we've had, is, is a wide range of, of methods by which these products are regulated. Some, as, as again, as the previous panel noted, some are regulated as drugs in some countries. In other countries, they're, ma they're regulated as foods. So it varies considerably from country to country. Uh, focusing specifically on Germany, are you aware as to, to how Germany uh, regulates uh, vitamins and, and botanicals? I don't know the specifics on uh, on many of their products. I think you heard again from the previous panel, Mr. Blumenthal gave some description of how they deal with botanicals uh, when they are marketed as drugs. And uh, during the course of, of these meetings, have, have you, uh, as a representative, experienced any problems? In, in, not before the meetings, during the course of these meetings. What, what, what problems have you uh, encountered and how have you dealt with them? Well, as with all meetings, you have a great range of, of opinions, some of which are quite strongly uh, held. We have worked closely with the other members of our delegation to consult before we go into sessions to decide how the U.S. wants to deal with these issues. Um, we have worked with uh, countries that we think will be allies on various positions and so I think very much as you do here in the Congress we try to to find an optimum solution. But when, when you say sort of uh, uh, confabbing before the delegation goes in, is, is there, by the time you get to the meeting, is there unanimity of opinion uh, or at least what the United States position is? Well, we present or submit a written position from the U.S. delegation prior to going to the meeting, and then uh, obviously we have to adjust during the meeting. The written um, statement, re written uh, position of the U.S. delegation is put out for comment. We have two public meetings prior to finalizing it and, and sending it out. We, we very much take into account the comments we get to the best of our ability. We try to reach a consensus. Uh, but it does go through a very public and transparent process prior to being submitted. Is, is it, you mentioned the Congress, is it similar to, here we don't all agree on every issue, as you know, on a, on a daily basis, but um, is, is it the type of document, since I haven't read one, is it the type of document that has then minority views or dissenting views? Well, there is a report of the committee meeting that uh, lays out where the various countries uh, what their positions were on various issues. So there is a report for each of the committee sessions that is publicly available. Okay. Well, I don't have any uh, further questions. Mr. Levitt, did you recall what it is that uh, you, you wanted to say a few minutes before? All right. Well, you know what? If it, if it comes to you in a dream or something later, maybe you can write it down and, and send it to us. And, and seeing that there's nobody else here, I, I thank you very much for your attendance. I thank everyone that appeared today. And this, uh, this meeting or hearing will be adjourned.
Here's a look at the schedule this morning. First, former Clinton officials discussed the impact of 